All right. Well, good morning and thanks for sticking around, everybody. This is the last day of our coverage of the Lake George Scrabble Tournament. As always, Matt Kanick leading the coverage. And once again, we're joined by Charles Reinke today. Charles, how are you doing this fine Sunday? Uh, it's not too early for me. I'm usually awake by this time on weekdays. So waking up this early on a weekend is no problem for me. I'm ready to watch some Scrabble. Yeah, this Scrabble better be worth it because uh, when you work from home with flexible hours like I am, um, sometimes this is a little bit too early. 8.30 central time is when we start coverage. But hey, we'll roll with it. Y'all are going to get me in my zombie form and after a couple cups of this coffee, we'll be ready to go. Um, we are starting our coverage today with the CSW division. Uh, two guys you may have heard of before, Ben Schoenbrunn and Josh Sokol. Uh, both of these guys won $10,000 at various tournaments over the summer, and we're going to cut to the action now as we watch Ben, who has been on a very hot run, try to uh, retain his lead on first place. Ben dropped his last game yesterday. He was off to a 10-0 and start, but dropped the last game, one player at 9-2, and two, and Josh in third at 8-3. and three. A win here for Josh would make things very interesting. A win here for Ben would make it a two-horse race for first place in the CSW division. So let's see how things go. Charles, what are you looking forward to in this one? Uh, if uh, Ben continues to play like um, he's been playing this whole tournament, I expect him to score a lot of points. That's not a very bold prediction, but I'm looking for a high-scoring game here. Yeah, yeah, we've seen a lot of points from both of these, although this is not how Josh is uh, going to start the scoring in this game. N-N-O-O-G-U-X, the pull for him. And unless there is a ridiculous Collins bailout here, I think we're looking at Knox or Ox. Is that right, Charles? Yeah, there's uh, no reason to keep the X at this point in the game. Um Unlike a letter like the Z, which will have you know, utility throughout the game, the X at the beginning of the game is not super useful. So might as well just get rid of it now and start going towards the bingo. Yeah, so G-O-X holds N-N-O-U. N-O-X holds G-N-O-U. Neither of those leaves looks particularly promising, although there are bailouts for both of those to get a bingo next turn. Looks like Josh is looking at bingos in the 15% range next turn after either of those plays. So not great, but it could be worse. You know, we've seen bingo percentages in the 1% or 2% range with certain leaves. So not the worst. And it looks like Josh reluctantly, you know, realizes he has no better options here with the way he's pulled. And Knox is going to be the first play this game. 20 points for Sokol. And Ben looks to respond out of A-A-A-C-I-I-R which is not going to be very good for him either. I think we're going to see just a three-letter overlap here. A-I-A -A on the left side of Knox, making an, I-O, and A-X. Seems pretty standard to me. Charles, do you see anything else? Uh, no, that actually, that seems clearly the best play. It sets up the R for Raya, uh, possibly ending bingos in an R. The, the leave A-C-I-R, uh, quite promising the most promising leave you could keep with these letters really unless possibly playing off another i so and it scores points doesn't really give anything back it looks like a great play and that's uh what we see him do yeah so aia gonna come down for ben um setting up the r in the front as charles pointed out and josh has found uh, at least moderate relief from the terrible pull he had on the first turn e-g-n-o-s-s-u the wreck for him now. Uh, still no bingos available, but he'll have some longer plays that help him shed this garbage. S-U-G-O is a nice word here in the CSW lexicon, and it plays with S-A-X for 17 points. S-O-U and S-A-X, another option. Each of those plays are going to telegraph pretty clearly to Ben that Josh probably has at least one more S but I'm not sure what else he could do in this situation. Perhaps play Negus, N-E-G-U-S, making Ion and Axe, but all of these plays are going to shed one of his two S's. Charles, what do you think out of this situation? Probably for Josh, uh, since he has nothing else that is really 
keeping great leaves without telegraphing the S, you probably just bite the bullet and uh, play one of them off. Uh, an interesting wrinkle of this position that um, NWL players might not realize is that the word A-N does take an S in the Collins Dictionary. So there's that sort of bailout bingo spot available to him that if this were an NWL game would not be available to him. And um, I, Josh has you know, repeatedly said that he doesn't have great Collins knowledge, but I'm sure he's aware of that hook. Certainly he knows, you know, the twos and the threes and a lot of the fours in this lexicon, at least. You know, Josh, a, a very strong NWL player. We all watched him win the Scrabble Players Championship uh, over the summer in $10,000 in the NWL lexicon and then promptly switch over to the CSW lexicon and try to play in the World Championship. Uh, so impressive uh, bilexuality there for Josh. And uh, actually, I don't know if you saw this, Matt. You might have been looking at your Quackle screen, but a couple minutes ago, there was seemed to be an aborted handshake attempt. Um, Josh extending the handshake and Ben refusing it. So um, we're looking for at a contentious game, possibly some bad blood. Uh, I mean, both players yeah. gunning, gunning for it and don't want to wish the other any kind of good luck whatsoever. These are two of the meanest guys over the Scrabble board. Just absolute killers. Look at that look on Ben's face right now. Just the death stare. Staring down Sokol, trying to get in his head. I, I, I Entirely kidding, of course. These guys are both very friendly dudes if you get to know them. But aborted handshake. Perhaps COVID precautions. Perhaps mind games. Perhaps bad blood. What do you think, chat? Let us know. I think we're going to see Negus here. Or just Neg. No, Negus it is. So we're going to float that S out in the middle of the board. Um, but, you know, what else can you do out of a terrible rack like this? Maybe Sugo, maybe Negus. I don't know. That's a tough play. This is what Josh opts for, setting up that Ions spot for himself in the future. And we'll pass back over to Ben, who does not have a bingo out of this bingo-prone rack, A-C-E-F-I-R-T. But there is one very high scoring play available to him, uh, clearing away the top play for Ben in this situation. I won't spoil it just yet, but I will tell you the score is 48. Yeah, this, this is the type of rack where I would be looking at that floating S and wondering do I have a bingo there? It looks like very bingo prone letters. It looks like. Whoa. Ooh, okay. Not expecting this. So Farsi is a word. Um, actually, let me double check that. Um, Farsi, yeah, is a word. It takes an S, um, but it does not compare. So Farsiest, Farsi are both not words. Yeah, it doesn't compare, but it does pretty much everything else. It takes a D in CSW, F-A-R-C-I-E-D but does not compare, not an adjective, and been uncharacteristic and lose a turn here. He did have the double-double facture available, F-A-C-T-U-R-E, for 48, but instead he will score zero and keep these same tiles as Josh has found another S and a Q. D-O-Q-S-S-U-Y, the pull for him, and he looks to build now on this lead. Um, he can play S-U-Q-S in a number of places, either with S-A-N or with A-I-A-S. Uh, each of those are going to burn two more S's, but score 37 or 36 points, respectively. He could think about, oh, I like this quite a bit, I'd have to think it through, but just S-U-Q from the S in Negus. You know Ben's entire rack now, so you'd have to go through and think about what kind of blocks he could have, but you know he doesn't have an S. You've seen his full rack. What do you think, Charles? SCQ for 12? Uh, yeah, that would definitely be worth considering. You you do have to sort of iterate through Ben's rack and figure out if he can somehow, for example, get his F, like maybe play IF uh, right underneath Suk and try to disrupt that S hook that you're setting up for yourself. But um, that's the kind of sort of slightly out of the box thinking um, that sets these players apart. The Especially when you know your opponent's full rack, you can make an extremely informed play 
I would expect Josh to take a little bit of time here just for that reason. You see the facial expressions he's making. You know he's thinking about it. You know he's thinking about it. Josh, uh, for those less familiar, one of the more creative players on the circuit, loves setting himself up and kind of thinking outside of the box abstractly like that. Um, Q-U-O-D looks like such a standard little play here. Yes, let's go, Josh. Let's go. Let's go. No. Okay. Well, he opts to put the S at the end. Uh, of course, that makes a lot of sense. It scores, what, 14 more points uh, versus the setup that's just going to get thwarted. You don't want to allow Ben to play IF here, although that floating S does allow Ben to bingo with Farsiest next turn. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a crucial misstep, misstep by Josh, <clears throat> giving up that floating S for Farsiest, which we, we certainly haven't seen attempted once before. Uh, this, this sequence actually works out well for Josh, and he probably calculated this as well. Um, holding an S, knowing that he's giving back Fakir for Ben, and hoping to punish Ben for that um, that S spot. So uh, he's gonna punish him hard as he's got massive bingos at the bottom now. Uh, three bingos that score over a hundred points. So Josh set the trap. Ben jumps in immediately. He's got twenty two fifty on his clock. Ben, think a little harder about this. It's Josh. You know, you know something's fishy here. So you can see Josh setting up either Mozied or Hozied here. Those both play for 101, but Josh has an even higher scoring option available, one that will drop the Y on that double letter square for 110. And I won't say it just yet. Yeah, I, I guess I can give a spoiler here. If anybody was watching the uh, MGI Grand Slam tournament, uh, I think was going on on Friday, uh, the word that Josh has here for 110 points was also played in one of the streamed games at the MGI tournament. So uh, people who are addicted to watching Scrabble online might already know this word. If you're addicted to watching Scrabble online, welcome to the club. And it looks like we are going to see Josh drop the highest scoring bingo. He's found it. That blank is a G. Geodesi, the word, 110 as Ben falls right into the trap that Josh had set. This, I think, is what sets Josh apart. He knew exactly what was about to happen here. He knew he was giving up Fakir, and he knew he was holding on to an S to smash this. Now, the blank, the 110-point bingo, maybe not what he was expecting, but you always miss and swing it in your favor. You try to set the trap, and Josh has done a wonderful job of that here, showing what makes him so brilliant as a Scrabble player. Yeah, this sequence really couldn't have gone any better for Josh, and you, you can't say that he planned it out exactly this way, because Scrabble is random, of course. You can't plan out anything exactly, but this pretty much went the way he wanted it to go. So kudos to Josh for making a good sequence of plays, and uh, now he's really in total command of this game. Uh, ben did not draw well after Fakir. He's got uh, four E's on his rack and um, not seeing any high scoring plays available for him. So he's just gonna fall further into the hole here. Yeah, and he's got it open and alive now that he's staring down a 120 point deficit with garbage on his rack. Um, we'll see how Ben decides to do that. There's some ways that are more aggressive, some that are slightly less aggressive. Uh, one that stands out to me, E-R-N-E, -E, through the R in Fakir, looked to be a good play. But in CSW, this word takes a back D as well. And Josh has pulled into two of those. So you want to set up the spot. And I think you need to take this chance, even independent of the D back hook. But Josh has pulled what he needs, and it's going to shut this spot down, assuming he does know this four to make five hook in CSW. Yeah, it's, a, it's a little bit of a weird hook, honestly. I don't think I've been playing CSW for a few years now. I don't think I would necessarily remember that Aaron takes a D. Um, but just to play like DO for Josh, not giving anything back to the triple and shutting his duplicates and just getting rid of that spot would be a certainly a nice choice. 
So Josh, with the D, he's going to have to figure out how to address the hook. Uh, the most defensive way maybe would just to play D-O down, earned and D-O, but you'd like to score a little bit more and turn over a few more tiles. Although if you do that, you're opening up a triple word square that, that uh, Ben can play down to. So you've got other plays, Dodo or Dildo are acceptable plays, Dido maybe, and earned as well, but... Those allow you to get hit back by big bingos on the triple word square. If I am going to play a longer word here, I think I'd be looking to lead with the L, as there's no L-E in the lexicon, so you couldn't play a lot of bingos to the right side. You could still make L-A, L-I, L-O. There's still lots of stuff you could do, but at least not giving up the E hook would be big. Charles, what do you think? Are you playing earned here? And if you are, what else are you going to play with it? Uh, I would probably just play it safe with only do the the remaining leave while not not anything to write home about it's not terrible either and just sort of solidifies the position for josh he, he's up by two bingos that spot any spot he opens on the right side of the board will immediately be the the highest scoring bingo spot available to ben and he doesn't want to give up huge huge bingo scores and so it looks like he either does not see the hooker is passing it up for one reason or the another. And it's a good scoring play here, DI. Uh, so again, does a good job scoring, doesn't keep as well, but I think I, I do I do like how it blocks the the bingo line to the right of the F in Fakir. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It sets up a T and an S, but it does block bingos ending in like a vowel, an E, or an ERS bingo. So maybe a wash there, but um, still a good play. Yeah, it, it, nothing else, it changes the bingo line. And I think maybe Josh looking at some of these ION extensions, he's got Asian, uh, Ocean on his rack now. So the T's, I think, are going to be pivotal for setting up a lot of cool plays for these players. Uh, as we turn back to Ben, again, he's looking to open up this board. He trails 203 to 69. And before I'm even able to offer analysis, he plays not what I thought he was going to play. I expected this to be B-E-T-E-S instead of B-I-T-E-S. Uh, you don't want to hold the double E's if you don't have to. Do you have any uh, any thoughts here, Charles, on why he played bites over beats? Um, I'm actually not sure. I feel like... Playing the E instead of the I is clearly superior um, just to get rid of the duplicates. <clears throat> it's possible that he thinks B-E-T-E -E does not take an S. There's a couple weird Collins words like that, which are, you know, a past tense of a verb, and then they don't take an S for that reason. Um, so he might just not be sure and doesn't want to phony again. Um, e either of these plays is decent enough, though. It, it reestablishes... Uh, the bingo line and yeah i guess i i can't can't come up with another reason why keeping two e's would be valuable here yeah i'm not i'm not seeing it if it exists but maybe i just need a little more coffee uh josh once again has plays making e-r-n-e-d uh, a-l-l-o-d is a very nice five that will bail him out of this rack uh, but I, I think it's been it's pretty apparent he doesn't know that hook or doesn't see that hook. So he's got to look for other ways to obstruct the board. There is only one unseen S. So if you're Josh, you're thinking maybe the S is the only hook to earn. Like to knock that out. And so a play like Bolo or Bool, B-O-L-O -O or B-O-O-L, look to make some sense from that B. Um, I'd prefer those over a play like Bold, as I don't like giving up the D on that triple word square, bingoing down to it is very likely, and those bingos are going to be 100. That's the one thing I don't want to let Ben do. I don't mind if he bingoes down front hooking AN or front hooking AIA or back hooking AIA. Any of those are going to expose a triple word for me, and I'm going to hit you back. Um, but I'm worried about this earn spot a little bit more, and I don't want to set up an even more lucrative one. So Josh is going to play Allod here, obstruct the earns hook as well without giving too much back. And I like this here for Josh. Yeah, I really do like this. If if Josh has been pegged for the last S, which he might after earn, um, making the word id there, id, does mostly prevent 
than from bingoing in that spot that he created for himself. And this play really doesn't give back any huge scoring hot spots for Ben. It, it plays a bunch of clunky letters all at once. Uh, I do like this play a lot. Yeah, not a bad play, although this does give Ben uh, a, a better option than anything he previously had just through the BO that Josh has created above plays to the triple for 30 points. It does hold on to two Cs, which is not ideal, but 30 points out of this rack is a lot. Getting that E floating out on that triple word square to bingo down to, from, or through all of that sounds good to me if I'm facing 140 point deficit. So above, I think the best option here, but it looks like Ben once again, playing very quickly, going to play caveat here, setting up another big S spot. You see Josh's face right there. Uh, oh boy. Uh, all right. Are you setting it up again? Okay. Well, I don't know how to respond to that threat, but caveat's going to come down here for Ben and it looks like Josh has set up Boatman on his rack. He's going to be able to play that in two spots, and he's wasting no time to choose the higher scoring of those. Boatman is 81 here. It also plays with NAN for 68, but of course you're taking the extra points in this situation. So Josh surges ahead 302 to 111, and doing a thing that we thought up until the last game of yesterday was undoable, beating Ben Schoenbrunn in a game of Scrabble. Yeah, it seemed seemed like Ben was unbeatable, but it turns out if Ben does gets these types of draws and Josh gets these types of draws, then actually quite straightforward to beat Ben. And it looks like Ben is just going to um, take the five-point penalty to make sure that Boatman is a word, and uh, it will come back good. All right, so this game feels all but over. Ben does have two options to open this board wide back up and score a good chunk of points in the process. Uh, each of those two plays are going to be creative, hard to find extensions to the ION, uh, six letter front extensions that would open up a brand new quadrant of this board. Um, they'll score, depending on which one he finds, either 36 or 42. Um, so I'll just kind of leave that right there and let y'all play with that for a little bit. Yeah, I feel like at this point, Josh must have been pegged for the last S. Ooh, Ben is go. going to find it. Found it. The the slide, the the worst of the two options to the ION, but the the other one is uh, Collins only a Collins only nine. Um, it it can't be derived from a, a shorter word like Criterion can be. So we we would not expect Ben to find the other play, which was Tricerion. So swapping the C and the T to score a few more points. It's apparently a word that's news to me. I'm sure it's news to you as Matt or news to you as well matt um but this is still a great play to get a ton of points and open up a ton of letters for future bingos yeah well spotted play for ben and of of the human options i think easily the best one for him um tricerion an anagram we all just learned again no no derivatives or anything like that but that would have been a little bit higher scoring though you know out of that rack, Criterion, nicely spotted for Ben, and he's going to be rewarded with a blank and some other goodies as well. That Z is going to allow him to make ZE plays above Earn and open a triple-triple. So a play like Zig could actually be very scary uh, for Josh. But Josh has a 40-point double-double here. He spotted it. The word is inherit. And uh, I think this is also an instructional turn for many folks. It is so easy to play Hive to the E and criteria on there. INRT looks like a great leave. Hive is 20 points out of a pretty junky rack. It's so easy to make that play, but Josh taking the extra time to continue looking, finding 40 instead of 20. And that is exactly what you want to do here if you're Josh. Just score every turn so you can't be caught. Nice job here from Josh. And Ben, got to figure out what he wants to do with these goodies he's found now. DEG. I-O-Z blank. Uh, he can score 
81 this turn. He can score 80 this turn, or he can play Zig and ZE to set up a triple-triple here. The 80-point play is both going to spend his blank. Zig for 48 will not. Charles, what would you look to do here? Plays like Gazebo through the B and Boatman for 81, available right now, or pray for the triple-triple and try to win this game. What do you think? Uh, I think given the score deficit, which sits exactly at 200 points, uh, even my math-challenged mind can figure out that number. Uh, he's got to try to do the two-turn sequence where he scores with the Z and then tries to bingo. I don't think just burning the Z for a bingo-like score while using his blank is uh, the way to get back in this. And it looks like Ben agrees with my assessment. He's going for Zig making a spot that has to be addressed while keeping the blank. And that spot can be addressed rather easily in a number of ways. You know, just two tiles be behind BO um, would block not only the spot created by the G and Zig, but also caveat and its hooks uh, for bingo plays. But I think I like the thought here from Ben, holding that ED behind the G too uh, makes it even more dangerous. So we'll see what he's able to find out of the bag. Um, that doesn't look promising, at least at first, but uh, there may be something there. I'm not smart enough to tell you the answer to that right now. So uh, this is, I feel, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I feel like uh, Josh really just has to do gov here, even if he has higher scoring or better keeping options on the board. He's... He's aware that the easiest and most straightforward way for Ben to get back in this game is just a triple-triple. And so he's got a tailor-made play for blocking that G over on the right side of the board and playing off his two worst letters, which are the U and the V. That feels like the play that has to be made unless I'm missing something. Yeah, if I'm, I would love to try to make like a five or six letter word down to or through the G to obstruct a little bit more but I'm not seeing it. This is going to do something kind of similar. Um, Fugle here is going to uh, block a little bit more of that lane. MRV, not the most stable leave, but Josh, as long as he finds a couple of vowels here, is going to be okay. He'd love to hold on to that V for its blocking prowess. So uh, we'll see what he's able to pull, but four consonants could be interesting. There's one, uh, but we, he's found a vowel, two vowels and uh, the J as well. So Josh will be scoring very well next turn after addressing the threat set up by Ben. The Hail Mary thrown out by Ben last turn, uh, opening the triple-triple uh, blocked by Josh right away. And once again, Ben needs to decide, do I take a big gamble and try to open something up? Or at this point, is it more about spread conservation? There are three more games to be played in the tournament after this one. Um, and now I've got at least Josh one game behind me, assuming I lose here. So Ben's got to make a decision. Clearly last turn, he went down swinging. But now that that's been addressed, Josh could continue scoring. Um, what do you do here? Do you keep trying to open the board? You've got a very nice play in Euro, E-U-R-O, that plays beneath Boatman for 34 points. I think you just kind of do that. No reason to keep opening triple triples. You'll probably get at least one bingo down between the caveat hook, the floating C and R, and Criterion. I think you just play Euro and kind of roll over and lose here. Would you be swinging? Would you be opening triple triples at this point, Charles? Um, I, I, I might be if there was a good way to do it while scoring some points. Like Zig was really the perfect play for doing both, for scoring and opening a spot. Um, with Ben's letters on this turn... He, he might be able to do something to the E of caveat, um, but it's only going to score like 12 points and give up a huge, huge scoring spot for Josh. And so in most situations, that goes poorly for Ben. He comes out further behind than he was at the start. So I do like Euro here. Um, keeps, you know, D-O blank. It can work with some of the, the available bingo spots on the board while also scoring enough to credibly still be in range if he hits like a bingo, another bingo, and maybe a, a J-bomb or something. 
Yeah, but uh, Chance is quickly sneaking away from Ben in this one. He's got to be sub 2%, probably sub 1% at this point. Not quite ever going to say 0% in a game of Scrabble. Josh could, for whatever reason, accidentally play Weave down to the E and Caveat and uh, open things up. But Josh in commanding position here. There are some goodies in the bag, um, some bingo prone tiles, 1A, 1E, 1I, an S and a T, plus that blank look good, and then a lot of high scoring tiles. So if there is a bingo that Ben's going to have, it's probably going to score a lot of points. It's probably going to come with some heavy consonants in it. So I think Josh sees this and is just like, you know what, I'm not getting beat by a 105 pointer in the caveat spot. Let me just take that away. He's going to play B-O-W-R here and uh, address the spot for, for the highest scoring bingos on the board, which I think makes a lot of sense from Ben. And we'll uh, pass things back, or from Josh, we'll pass things back over to Ben now. Um, I haven't seen his draw since his Euro play, but I know he's got that blank on his rack. So D-I-K-N-O-O blank, the rack for Ben, and he trails by 175. He has no playable bingos this turn. One last Hail Mary attempt uh, available. He can string that K out in a triple-triple line in a couple of ways. He could play Kondo, K-O-N-D-O, and O-I, or he can play Coin right here as he's setting up to do K-O-I-N-E. Um, so coin is what Ben's going to do just a hail Mary, see, see what happens. You know, this gets blocked. If Josh has all consonants, all vowels, anything because of the K and the O out there, if you got all consonants play through the O to block, if you got all vowels play through the K to block, but at least try to keep the board a little bit dynamic. Yeah, th this is something that Ben wasn't really able to do effectively last turn, but he drew the K and that sort of changes how worthwhile a play like this actually is because he does score pretty well you know just from a scoring and leaf perspective coin was one of his best plays uh the fact that it also opens a triple triple that has to be addressed that's also you know just kind of a bonus to making what is otherwise a very strong play and um we see ben has not drawn super well after coin certainly no triple triples through the k i expect um, but the, the threat is there that Josh has to address. And he's actually got somewhat awkward tiles uh, to to address it. I'm seeing like a Jiva through the eye would get rid of a lot of the clunkers, but it doesn't block the K. It this looks is like he's good. everything you want to do. Is, yeah, this is, this is a good play. This is a very good play from Josh. So Java, definitely squandering some equity here, but you're more than happy to squander that if you're able to block as well as this and avoid getting caught with your pants down with the VJ at the end of this game. So uh, good play by Josh. And D-O-P-P-T-Y blank, the rack for Ben. Ten unseen tiles, three in the bag. We'll work on getting that displayed, but if I know Ben... I expect to see him just kind of blitz through this end game pretty quickly. He knows he's lost. Unseen display is coming up quickly for y'all um, as we see what kind of Hail Mary Ben can put together here. But it'll be far too little and far too late in a game that seemed like it might be close than one phony played by Ben early on, one clever trap set by Josh and then one huge punishment after Ben took the bait. For those missing uh, missing the events earlier, Farsiest was a phony played through the S and Negus by Ben uh, as a natural bingo. Josh played S-U-Q-S, -S, uh, knowing he would give up Fakir, but Josh held another S, so he knew he would be able to pounce on that Fakir spot, and he drew into Geodesi for 110 points after Ben played his Fakir play. So uh, just a little cat and mouse game. Josh set the trap, sprung the trap, and it has been all downhill for him ever since. Yeah, we do want to shout out Ben for that play of Criterion, though. That was uh, a very creative and actually necessary play for him at that point to to open stuff up. And both players would be looking at that ION spot for words ending in T-I-O-N, but to find something like Criterion, which doesn't fit that criteria, um, it's a, a really good play by Ben. So 
props to him in sort of a losing situation. It's kind of easy to roll over and give up at that point. Um, but he made the play. He made the find that he needed to. Unfortunately, still down by 180. So it didn't quite work out for him. But props to him nonetheless. This is one of the things you'll notice about very good players uh, in the game of Scrabble is that it is so hard to shut the door on them. You can draw everything, and yet I still feel like any time I play like a Josh or a Jackson, you know, I've drawn the entire bag, and still two or three turns from the end, I'm like, uh, am I sure I'm going to win this game? You know, they're so clever and crafty at finding ways to stay alive and keep their heads above water, as Ben was able to do Criterion of wonderful play see him going down opening these triple triples he is not going down without a fight and uh, really not till that last turn that did we feel a hundred percent sure josh was going to win this game and uh, it looks like ben has been rewarded for his um for his efforts he actually uh, assuming it doesn't get blocked he has dopester making caveats um oh, to wow. probably go out and uh close the spread gap significantly Oh, he's playing, he's playing. He's playing a despota, which is this is still a good good play, still a good find. One of his few available bingos, but he shouldn't be playing so quickly here. He should be um, trying to make sure he doesn't have a better bingo because spread does matter in these tournaments. Spread matters a ton, especially as you're about to drop this game to Josh. He's going to be one game behind you with three to go. This is definitely a rush. Dopester is 95, a despota 78. So that is going to be a big point or a big swing in the spread of this game as Ben rushed that turn just a little bit. You'd, we know he knows the word dopester. Uh, for those at home, there's also a playable nine for Ben on that turn. If you want to give yourself a little puzzle, there's another bingo that plays through the R in B-O-W-R as well. So if you're looking for a puzzle, find the nine find uh the the play through the r let's cut to mike and see what kind of banter we get from these guys here Well, this is just the least exciting post-mortem I've ever heard. Yeah, I can't say that we uh, learned too much from that other than both players agree that Ben's draws were bad. Sometimes there's just not much to say. Ooh, I shouldn't have played Farseeist. I did, and I got crushed. I think that's really all the analysis we have to offer for that one. So with that, Josh Sokol makes the Collins division very interesting. Three games to go now. Josh, one game behind Ben, who looked to be a runaway uh, with that division just two games ago. He was 10-0. and Now he's 10-2. and Josh, 9-3. and If Matthew O'Connor are able to win, Matthew will also be 9-3. and uh, So this could get very interesting. And I see Jason Keller has also won his game to jump to nine and three. So Ben at 10 and two, potentially three players, one game behind him, Matthew O'Connor, Jason Keller, and Josh Sokol. Things are getting very interesting here in the CSW division. I do not know what we are going to broadcast next, if it's going to be a CSW or NWL game. I am going to yield to our production team on the ground. Uh, and I will keep everybody updated just as soon as I know what we're going to show in the next game. But uh, Charles, what do you think? If you have to make a bold prediction now, I give you four very talented players at the top of this CSW field. Three games to go. Who's going to win? Uh, I think I alluded to this earlier, although I didn't name a name when I was asked on Friday. Bold predictions for the Collins division. And I said, somebody unexpected would would do very well or win it. Um, one of the names I was thinking was Josh, Josh Sokol. He's not an established Collins player. He's only recently switched to the lexicon. But the the strategy and the board vision, uh, the word 
the exist pre-existing word knowledge, it all transfers so easily for him. And uh, I was expecting him to do well, and he is doing well. So um, I'm 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 thinking he he has a good shot to win this. Yeah, I mean Josh Josh brings something to the CSW field that I don't think is is super prominent, at least not in in our scene here in in North America, and that's just this very cerebral, creative approach to the game. Uh, that's something we don't see a lot of really anywhere in top level Scrabble. I think we used to see a little bit more of it, but the advent of all these computer programs and their algorithms and their math and their simulation, I think a lot of people have started to play a lot more like a computer. And Josh, a breath of fresh air into what has become a lot of people who play very similar. So I think Josh, uh, especially if you don't know his game, you're going to fall, you're going to take his bait, you're going to take the trap, you're going to play Fakir for 34 a lot. So uh, will be will be very interesting to see. Although Josh, as he plays more tournaments, is getting more and more exposure to these players, and they're getting more exposure to him and his mind games and his traps. Anyway, it'll be very fun to watch this one shake out. Uh, I think as we try to figure out what matchup we're going to bring, we're going to cut to a brief intermission. Your boy needs a little bit more coffee to be up this early. So y'all don't go anywhere in the chat. I will make a quick plug. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to Let's Play Scrabble. Make sure you like this video. Bump us up this algorithm uh, for the last day of play. Share the link around, man. It's the it's the championship day. We got three games to go. Let's get people watching Scrabble on this Sunday. And uh, with that, we will cut to a brief intermission. Y'all don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Three more games today.
Welcome back, folks. Uh, we are back with more Scrabble for y'all. We're giving you an NWL game next between first place Michael Fagan and second place Jackson Smiley. Uh, Michael Fagan, with three games to go, is up by one game on Jackson and two on the rest of the field. And on top of that, Michael has a lot more spread than anybody else. So Jackson needs a victory here or Fagan is all but Gibsonized in this one. This could be the final re reasonably intense game in the NWL division to show y'all. Um, but we'll see if you want more NWL, you're Jackson fans today. If you want uh, back to CSW, you are Michael Fagan fans. But that is the matchup that we are going to bring you next. I uh, see we've got Charles's Twitch name up above him now. So if y'all are not following Charles on Twitch, 
take this little break here to go ahead and do that. We have a couple minutes before players are going to sit down and begin the game. So y'all get a little bit of dog action in the background. As you can see, my boy's playing with a rope toy. And uh, on top, yeah, there you go. You got the, got the pointing the right direction. Um, so that'll be a little treat for you. Um, I will say a, a little preview to the Jackson Fagan matchup. The book on Michael Fagan a couple years ago before he had his run of success and won the Nationals is he has a hard time getting himself to challenge words. And the book was something especially Canadians knew on Michael. So Jackson, Josh, and I uh, used to drop a lot of phonies and put that onus on Michael. Like, you've got to make these tough decisions to challenge. And we found that phonies stayed on the board a lot. So I know Fagan knows the book on him is out at this point, but it will be an extra level of mind games that we're going to watch in this matchup. If Jackson is in any kind of desperate situation, I would not be even remotely surprised if he makes up a word and puts it down. And we'll see Fagan once again get put into those very tough situations where he's got to make a call on challenging a word. But uh, this is my favorite part of double challenge. I'm putting this out there one more time. I've been screaming from the mountaintops that I want this to happen. Um, tournament directors, I challenge you to just run a five-point challenge tournament or a double challenge tournament. But whatever lexicon is being played... Do the same challenge rule for them all. I would love to try an NWL event with five-point challenge, and I think I'd be a little more uh, eager to try CSW if there were some double challenge available. So that's my call to y'all. Let's let's change up challenge rules. Why is the, the challenge rule tied to a lexicon? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's shake things up. Let's make Scrabble spicy again. I'm going to patent that. Make Scrabble spicy again. Now that sounds too similar to something else. We're going to cut to Scrabble action before I get myself in trouble now. So uh, Fagan and Jackson seated at the board in what could be uh, an all but clinching game for Michael. Uh, we can see the players have sat down. Two guys very familiar with each other's games. Uh, and more guys from Montreal. Josh Sokol Rubenstein from Montreal. Jackson now lives there. Michael from there as well. So uh, getting a lot of love for the Canadian city and our Quebecois folks here. Jackson will get to play first, an advantage he's happy to have in this pivotal game uh, to decide this division. And he's found a blank on the first turn, which is going to be nice for him. Although the material he needed to get a bingo with this EGF HKT blank. And uh, Jackson, I think think gonna play kef or keg out of this rack but i'm not sure that ght synergizes fairly well together if you want to make a play like kef but the g is also a pretty terrible tile so makes some sense to play keg here as well another option k h e t holds the, the dreadful f g uh, combination so charles what do you think to do here what are you looking if you're jackson my my first thought is how can I get rid of as many consonants as possible? A play like Ket K H E E T does achieve that aim, but as you point out, Matt, the the F and the G do not play nicely with each other. You you don't want to keep them together if you can avoid it. Meanwhile, G H T has an above average amount of synergy, so you play one fewer consonant, but the consonants you keep are likely to work well together. So I, I feel like Kef is clearly correct for Jackson here. Um, Michael comes right back with Obi, which um, also seems to be, I shouldn't say unambiguously correct, but that's a very strong play as well, very straightforward play to unduplicate the O and the I while also scoring decently. So Obi the play, but it is going to set up Jackson for his highest scoring bingo of knots. You can see he's already got it set up, and it'll play making kefs and obit. So it looks like it might have been a blocking play, but it actually just allows Jackson to play his bingo for six more points. That'll be 86, and the highest scoring bingo for Jackson by 16 points on that turn. So knots coming down for Jackson. 86 points, and he couldn't have asked for a better start to this game if he wanted. Uh, he is now ahead 106 to 24, but Michael has pulled rather well and will look to respond. He's pulled bingos of his own. He can play through the G or through the A. 
Yeah, we we would expect Michael to find one of these bingos available to him. They're both um, relatively high probability and uh, should be straightforward. Um, I will note that we did see a successful handshake get pulled off at the beginning of this game, which was not the case in the previous game. So maybe that's an omen, uh, a good omen for a, a tight, uh, close, and well-played game. Perhaps so. Perhaps it is a good omen. Scrabble players notoriously lacking in dexterity. It is hard to get their hands to connect as we are just so coordinated across the board. But Jackson and Michael gritted it out and were able to shake their hands. Uh, several uh, Rogering, Gorgerin, Reorging, all valid words that I see through the G, and Orangier also plays through the A. So Orangier, a word Michael 100% knows. The bingo's through the G, maybe. But maybe not, although we see Michael taking the conservative option here. They all score the same, but in terms of defense, this is easily the worst option of his four playable bingos. Jackson going to be happy to get this gift as uh, Orangier comes down from Michael. He's responded now with his own bingo. He still trails by 12, and it is Jackson's turn. A-A-E-F-S-U-W, the pull for Jackson. And man, when I see all that stuff get exposed, triple words, double letters next to him, I want to crush him. I want to crush him. And Jackson's not going to be able to crush him here. Um, really no compelling options for him. A-W-A -A plays to the left side of Orangier, making A-I, W-E, and A-R. That's pretty terrible. You get overlapped a lot for a lot of points after that. Um, he can play Wage through the G and Orange Year, keep both of those big spots available. Um, but the AFSU leave is not particularly enticing. He just doesn't have a good way to punish any of the stuff that Michael has opened up on this poll, and he's got to be feeling a little bit frustrated by that. Charles, how would you approach this turn? Uh, I would, this is probably what Jackson is doing now, even though no plays jump out on either the O or the R of Orangier, Orangier um, I would just spend a little bit of time thinking about it because those are really the spots you'd want to play, um, playing off either the W or the F, uh, hopefully scoring like 36 or something. Um, we know from our access to Quackle that such a play doesn't exist. And then the, the question would become, do I want to leave both of those spots open? The, the thought there would be leave both of them open. Michael takes one of them next turn. You get the other one uh, on your own next turn. Or try to take the one that you feel is more dangerous. In this case, that it would certainly be the, the R at the bottom of the board. Um, play something like where, just W-A-R-E. And yeah, you're getting rid of your E, you're, you're not keeping really bingo prone tiles, but you are addressing uh, the most dangerous spot on the board. Uh, so that's probably some of the things that are going through Jackson's mind. Of course, we know he's an extremely high level player and there's probably 500 different things going on through his mind at any on any given turn. So these are situations where Quackle is rather helpful. Quackle, uh, the simulation tool, not always awesome for Scrabble one analysis tool, but it has many holes in its game. Uh, one of the biggest, most notable ones is that it can't really make inferences based on what your opponent has done. So Quackle, really best and most accurate when your opponent has just bingoed and has seven random tiles instead of has been grooming their rack for a while. Um, and a Quackle analysis says, you know what, just play AWA on the left side of Orange Ear anyway. Yeah, it looks scary um, and it opens up spots, but the Sim seems to like that play about five points more than what Jackson chose to do there. In any case, Jackson plays it. Michael has Salty and a Q, S-A-L-T-I-E-Q, and he quickly sheds Q-A-T uh, on his last turn, uh, which I think makes perfect sense. No other good options there. And we are back on Jackson's turn. A-F-J-O-S-U-Z, the rack for him. And had he played Awa last turn, he'd have Zarf right through it. But alas, he did not. He played Where, And uh, now he's going to have uh, tougher options to think about. Yeah, again, he's... He's got some scoring letters, and he's got to think about you know, how can I use these scoring letters for their maximum potential. 
now that both triples are open, he does have something, or sorry, both triples have been blocked. Uh, options are a little bit more limited here, but he does have something like Juga through the G of Orange here, keeping the Z always a nice tile, gets rid of the clunky J and U and scores. Uh, that'd be 40 points. So uh, I think a straightforward play here. Nothing else really stands out to me as a play worth making. And so not, yeah. not necessary to spend a ton of time on that turn. Quackle has the second best play there as Jugs in the same spot. And it's like, well, if I can keep the S and play the A instead, uh, I'm going to do that. So Juga, easily the best play for Jackson, and he's not going to spend any more time thinking about it. He's identified the same thing. So back to Michael, who has pulled some garbage. He was so close to a bingo. A-E-I-L-S-T-Q was his rack last turn. He plays off three tiles. You don't like breaking up those racks. You'd love to plunk QI and keep salty, but he had to to score points, and he's drawn some dreck afterwards. So he went from good to bad very quickly, picking up DUI. And I think we just see Michael play off DUI uh, right after he's pulled him. He can play DUI and QI, or he can play DUI and quid if he wants to play some aggressive offense. But... I kind of like that play of quid. You set up the E and the S in front of it. Maybe you get a bingo that scores 100 next turn. You open a double-double line as well. Um, if you're sitting on the good stuff, and Jackson's last couple plays don't indicate that he's got good stuff, quid is a really cool board opening play to try to capitalize on the good rack you have and the bad one your opponent seems to have. Yeah, I, th I think your analysis on this one is spot on, Matt. Uh, given the score and what Michael can infer about Jackson's letters, Quid is clearly going to outperform Dewey. Um, if, if you peg Jackson for just having sort of clunky high scoring tiles, the, the double letter, double word score combo that you open after Dewey is actually probably the most dangerous thing you could do. Whereas Quid does not really give back anything to somebody who has clunky high scoring letters. And it perfectly plays into the leave of EILS, um, giving him multiple opportunities to get a high scoring bingo. So quid here looks to be a very strong play. Uh, a sim has these two plays neck and neck, nearly identical, but once again, the limitation of Quackle is it can't make inferences. Jackson has just played AEW and then AJU. To me, those are plays Jackson has to make out of almost any rack, and don't tell me he's sitting on like an EIST or AELR or anything like that. So I think you capitalize on the advantage. Michael very wisely thinks the same thing. I love this decision by Michael, and we'll see if he's rewarded with a good draw into this very bingo prone EILS. And he is. Oh, that, that works out really well for him. Uh, that's a double double if it doesn't get blocked. Yeah, so if you're Jackson, I think the other spot, the, the first column, looks to be the more scary of the two things that was opened up. But Michael's pulled the double double instead. What an awesome decision by Michael. And, uh, just is wonderful that he is rewarded for it. You know, sometimes you make these great calls and you just don't pull the stuff to punish it. But, uh, you know, sometimes there is justice in Scrabble after all. Good decision by Michael. Good drop by Michael. A lot of points for Michael next turn. Yep, that, that should get him right back in this game. Although, um, if Jackson scores well this turn, it, it will be, it won't be quite even, but uh, it won't be home free for Michael by uh, any sense of the term. So Jackson had two decision or a, a big decision between two plays to make there. Zen is 48. He could play few in the same spot and retain that Z. And I think Jackson was trying to figure out, am I going to be able to cash this Z with squid plays after FEW? I'm holding Z-I-N-O-S. Uh, I don't really see anything I can draw that make words forming squid that are worth it. You know, I'd have to have a two tile pull that helps me form a word. So I think because of that, he, he foregoes it and just cashes it now, scores the points and says maybe this F or this W will help me hit that spot later. Michael has drawn into Obelize, O-B-E-L-I-S-E, -E, plays for 92, has a double double. And the fact that he hasn't played it yet Makes me think he either hasn't seen it or he's not sure this is good. And those I-S-E versus I-Z-E suffixes, especially in NWL, are so aggravating. 
uh, so, so aggravating. People mix these up all the time. It is an obnoxious list to try to memorize, but obelize does take the I-S-E spelling. And Michael, I don't think, has seen it yet. There's nothing else to think about here if he does. So I, th I think, Matthew, I, he briefly when he drew it, he had it set up. So he, he, I think he immediately saw it, and now I'm wondering if he's just unsure of it. Um, either that or it was sort of the, the randomness of how you pull your tiles onto your rack. But I, I'm pretty sure he deliberately set it up, and now he's, he's pondering. So uh, that causes some concern here in the commentary booth. Perhaps he's just looking for a nutso double double through the DG. Uh, perhaps he's looking for an anagram to try to take advantage of the equid or squid spot. But this to me is very surprising that a player of Michael's caliber hasn't played Obelize yet. This is high probability enough. He certainly studied it, and I'm surprised he's not confident on it. Yeah, if he decides to forego it, he can play something like B lies making squid. Uh, clearly inferior to the bingo by a significant margin, but still a, a pretty decent play. Um, but we really hope he spots the bingo here. Well, if you want more NWL today, you want Jackson to win this game and make the division very interesting. If you want CSW, you want Michael to play the bingo here and draw three more in a row. Three minutes now on this turn for Michael, where one play is head and shoulders above the rest. The valuation on Obelize, 92 points, as it's a 92-point bingo. The valuation on Belize, 37 points. So Michael would be losing a lot of valuation, over 50 points worth, if he misses the bingo here. And It looks like he also might be thinking of just playing Biles, making quids. He has that set up. Um which would uh, be inferior to Belize as well, not, not to mention the bingo. So we'll see what he does here. He's got a couple tiles in his hand, but that could just be him shuffling. He's set up Belize now, which I think is one of the two best non-bingo plays. And yes, Michael has missed the bingo. So everything I said, brilliant play, and he got you know, rewarded in the right way. I, I take all of that back now. It was still a good play, but you've got to find Obelize if you're going to make that. This is a mistake I see a lot of uh, intermediate players make a lot. They play as if they know all the bingos. They keep these great bingo-prone leaves, but then they don't know all the bingos, and they draw the bingo, and then they miss it. And missing a bingo out of a bunch of one-pointers is terrible because you're scoring 12 or 14. So anyway... Big tangent, but Michael has missed the double-double Obelize for 92, and that is very painful for him. Yeah, and I think the worst thing is he had set it up, so he, he was probably, possibly stream anxiety also playing a part, does not want to play a high-probability phony uh, on stream. Oh, my thinking is when I'm on stream, one, I don't want to play a, a phony of any sort, especially high-probability, but two, I also don't want to pass up a high probability bingo that I should know. So it kind of gets in your head a little bit. You know people are watching. They're sort of judging your word knowledge based on what you're doing. And you you you, you want to make the right play. And it can that extra layer of uh, discomfort, so to speak, can mess with your decision making. Michael though, no strange or no stranger to stream jitters or stream anxiety is he won a North American championship and was on stream for nearly all of it. Uh, Michael, for those less familiar with the story, was one of the lowest rated players in the field. And people kept expecting, okay, he's going to lose, right? He's going to lose, right? And he never did. And he played very well and ended up winning the entire event. So he's played on stream extensively. And it is hard to play on stream. Jitters are very real, but he should have outgrown those by now. I think that was just a miss. Yeah, I think, I think just missed it or was not quite sure of it. <clears throat> Uh, Jackson makes a maybe a sort of prescient play here, blocking a lucrative X spot next to Belize. Um, Michael still does have some okay X plays, um, but nothing on the level of just dropping the OX next to the BE of Belize. 
Michael can still score 50 this turn, but he has to blow up this rack to do so. Oxides and squids is 50 points somehow. I've had to count it like six times because I don't believe that that's 50 points, but it is. Michael instead, though, going to opt to play XI here, which I think is absolutely fine. D-E-O-S-T is a great leave, but if Michael draws a bingo here, he's got to spot it. No time to keep missing bingos if you're Michael. And uh, See, I, I, I heard we w the pull for Jackson, and he has one great option here. Stope, S-T-O-W-P, plays through the T-O, 42. He does shed the S, but the S is not all that powerful on this board as OK does not take the back S. And Jackson's already got it set up. I'm sure he's not going to find anything better. And Stope for 42 going to come down here. That'll put Jackson ahead 286 to 217. Though so Michael has pulled a nice rack once again. Dotters, the pull, D-O-T-T-E-R-S. Dotters is valid, and it plays in one spot, making D-I-D in the fourth row on this board. So Michael, once again, sets up his bingo immediately. This is another one where it's like, Am I making this up? This has to be a word, right? But what is a daughter? Um, this is good, right? So stream jitters may be a factor here once again, but Michael has to play daughters, right? Michael's not going to miss daughters. Yeah, it looks like he's getting ready to play it. Yeah. I agree, Matt. It, it's sort of a weird word, those ERS words. It's not And one is valid. Who cares what it means? We're Scrabble players. We don't necessarily care. And he does find the bingo to get himself right back into this game. There are so many of these ERS words. I think I think Michael's on hold. Ooh. I know Jackson's got to make the call. Oh, God. Michael's on hold. Yeah, and I, whenever I get put on hold, it doesn't matter who's holding me. I immediately have this like wave of self doubt, like, oh, I probably phonied. Why did I play a phony? This person knows what they're doing, and I'm a complete moron. Um, yeah, more often than not, I'm correct in those um, on those words. I'm not the one who's made the mistake. It's the person holding and challenging. But it's still, when you hear that hold, you're like, boy, did I just really screw up this game? And it turns out no daughters is valid. Jackson correctly determines that it's valid. And Michael's drawing his tiles. It could be courtesy draws. Oh, that's a very, are, very good point. Um, Michael's pulled Amirates to A-M-I-R-A-T-E-S. Through the odd that is a great post bingo draw. Jackson could play Viceroy to block it, except it doesn't quite fit. And I, I was thinking last turned on Michael waves. He just needed another tile randomly on the board to make it work. Um, so he's got, a, he's got a couple nice words here that don't quite make it on. And if you're Jackson here, you're looking, the, the V and the Y combination is not one that you want to keep around for too much longer. You might do something like IV just to, to play off letters, but that keeps too many vowels. So maybe you look to play off more tiles here. Jackson has one play that I really like in this situation. It is revoice, plays from the R um, and just thwarts this board, makes it very close. Now Jackson is only up by a narrow margin. Um, oh boy, we've got a different score. I've got Jackson at 286 to 281 for Michael um, after daughters. But whatever the score is, Jackson with a narrow lead, either four or five points, Revoice would score 22, put him up by 26. But it is Michael's turn, so that's a roughly neutral game. Uh, at the same time, though, after Revoice, it is so hard to score points effectively. Maybe you get one or two more high-scoring plays, and that's it. So that to be that seems like an awesome option if Jackson looks to play defense. If he wants to play a little bit more offense, like he's got set up, Evite, E-V-I-T-E, plays through the T and Daughters, um, holds C-O-Y, which is not going to bingo, but it is going to score quite well. The problem with the play like Evite, though, I feel like it makes this game a bingo or die situation, and whoever bingos next wins. It's one unseen blank to Jackson. Michael's just drawn seven tiles. I don't know that I like getting into a bingo or die situation, holding C-O-Y when my opponent might have a blank on their rack. I think we uh, I think we tighten things up. I think we play revoice 
and we go in an, into an end game situation, if at all possible. I love this play from Jackson as he agrees with everything I just said. Yeah, and I, th I think an another nice thing about revoice is it, it keeps just the why, which you're thinking, why does the why mean much at all? Um, very likely that you draw a five letter play through the T and daughters um, that makes it worth your while to open up that spot, basically. Like if you can draw a 36 point play um, ending in TY in that spot, that's going to be great for him. Um, otherwise, you know, doesn't need to go that route and make Michael figure out what to do with the sport. And this is one area where I see Scrabble players struggle a lot, especially Division I players. This board is completely dead to bingos now. It is nearly impossible to play a bingo on this board. And in these situations, you have to completely adjust every heuristic you've ever learned because no longer does it matter at all if you're keeping bingo prone tiles. What good are they? Maybe your opponent will open a line for you, but if they don't and you keep fishing, you're just going to lose. Yeah, sure, you'll have stainer on your last rack, and then you won't play it anywhere, and then you'll lose. Scoring becomes so, so important in these situations, and the why is a great way for Jackson to do that. So if there's any tile you could keep after a play like Revoice, the why has got to be up there on that list. Jackson's also found the second blank in this game, and that's going to be helpful for him scoring and ensuring Michael doesn't hit a Hail Mary bingo if a line gets opened up later. So uh, this will be a good one, folks. I love this play of Revoice, and I love the drama that it's going to bring up. Michael has a very hard turn here now as he's got these bingo-prone tiles. And as I said, you, you can't get caught up trying to bingo in these situations. Or if you are looking to bingo, you've got to keep opening the board and opening lines to try to do that. So a play like AIM does a little bit of everything for Michael. AIM just above daughter is making at, it, and me. Um, it sets up front hooks for the ME, but Michael holds on to an E, so that is a line that he can play in. Um, it scores reasonably well, holds bingo prone tiles if you're creating a new line. I guess that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, if he chooses to keep things tight as well, maybe he feels he's at the advantage in this game holding on to that S. He could also just play something like Page just uh, dropping AE, but I think aim at definitely the thing that Michael should do in this situation. Michael so, agrees. He did have a me set up, AMI, probably playing on top of daughters making AS, and that actually would be a, a kind of a creative board forking play because AMI takes an E, it also takes an S, takes a few other letters as well, sets up a bingo spot there, not to mention the spot above AS. Um, unfortunately, the spot above AS, you can't put an S there, you can't put an E there. So that bingo line would be a little bit less uh, dangerous, but that would have also been a creative play as well. Um, but he does decide to go for the points and just set up a single bingo line for himself. Yeah, it's a cool play, but it could get absolutely crushed. If your opponent plays like a five letter stack on top, you've just immediately lost the game. Just like everybody in chat, you have lost the game. Got to get it in once a tournament. Oh, I, I used to play that game in uh, high school, uh, really dating myself now. As did I, and now we are losers of it once again. Uh, Jackson needs to figure out how to address this new threat on the board. He knows Michael's not trying to set up a bingo with the blank as he's just pulled it. Got to be some peace of mind. But there are still several bingo prone tiles unseen to Jackson. Nine unseen, 22 in the bag, so just a little bit too much for us to show you unseen pool. But Jackson's got to figure out what he wants to do about this threat and about this board in general. Um, I'm not seeing good ways. Did they take out GYP, or is that still valid? Oh, uh, that is still valid, sort of surprisingly. Um, but that is that is still in, and it means what you think it means. Okay, so GYP and PAT is a play that he could make, but that sets up the big SPAT front hook with one unseen S to Jackson. That's one he can think about. It'll score well, hold well. CAN blank is a nice leave, but I don't think that's a level of variance Jackson wants in this game. He's got a slight lead. It's his turn. He's got the blank. We don't want variance. We don't want coin flips. We're in the driver's seat. Let's just grind this one out and take a 10 or 20 point victory. So I think that's how Jackson's looking to approach this. He has one sneaky good play. If he just wants to keep the board tight, 
he can play Icy from the eye and Orangier, making Acne. It doesn't score particularly well, but AGNP blank is a decent leave. Only one eye for him to draw, so maybe something to think about there. Uh, I'm trying to find other ways he can block that spot on top of AIM. He could play Yang, Y-A-N-G, making GAT on top. Uh, Gat has no front hooks, so barring a bingo starting in an E, he's addressed all bingo lines on this board once again. I think that might be a decent play. It only holds 14, holds PC together with his blank, but you know those are scoring tiles. Scoring tiles might be what he's looking to keep. I'll also point out one huge tile in this game is one that there are three remaining unseen of, and neither player has one. It is an L to make the Jugal hook. Uh, down at the bottom. So an L will be big to help either open or score, depending on who draws it. Lots to think about here. Yeah, d definitely the L, it, it seems minor, really. It's not going to score a ton of points, but playing something down from the G of knots, like just a three tile play, it does sort of open that board, so open that corner of the board back up to bingos, at least eventually. Like you, you make a play there, you make one more play and all of a sudden there's spots down there to bingo. So, it, I mean, it depends on which player decides how badly they want to bingo. At this point, uh, Jackson, it's, it's hard to read what AIM, what AIM actually meant. He might not have Michael pegged for bingo letters. And uh, Michael also might not have Jackson pegged for bingo letters. After Revoice and Yang, it just seems like sort of random plays. So A-Y-E going to come down here right away for Michael. This is certainly the equity play. You know, score 20 points, hold E-N-S-T. You got to remember E-N-S-T is not taking you anywhere on this board, but neither are the rest of these tiles. They don't score almost anything. So I think Michael still just got to put some scoring pressure on. I've got a tie game right now after AYE at 322 to 322. If I missed something, I guess I missed something. But I show tie game as Michael's pulled into and sated with no spot. Um, and we're back on Jackson's turn now. Um, C-D-N-O-P-U blank on Jackson's rack. And he's probably going to take some time on this turn. He knows the importance of his decision here. Yeah, Trying just looking at this this board, right. I actually don't see see anything good that keeps the board shut. It, it's, it's they're running out of uh, available spots to play, sort of on the left and the top of the board where they've been making most of their plays. Uh, there's not many places to put down letters anymore. So Jackson has to be careful that the play he chooses doesn't create you know unnecessary openings that are hard to deal with. Then again, he does have the blank, so. You know, if he draws, if he plays like DUP, making revoiced, something like that, sets up the S. I mean, even if Michael hits there, hopefully Jackson would be hitting back. Uh, the blank gives him a lot of flexibility to sort of play the way he wants to play. I'm trying to see what Jackson can do with the revoiced hook without setting up a hook. I see a play like Udo makes some sense, U-D-O, because it takes the back in but it also takes a back S and, you know, I just, I don't know if Jackson's ready to open up that level of variance. We have a tie game, uh, Jackson's turn. Jackson's got the blank. He's probably 60 or 70% to win. Um, it looks like he's looking at doc. Doc would just take the back S or a K if he wants to use the blank for that. I think that's a better version. I'd love to find a word here if I'm Jackson that has no hooks or has a hook that only I have but I don't see any words on his rack that'll do that. So this is a very challenging turn for Jackson. You know, my, my gut almost says just play something crazy like HUP, H-U-P for eight, just keep the board tight, but it is a tie game. You, you can't score eight. You need some points now to keep the scoring pressure on, and you don't want to see it a bingo if at all possible. As it turns out, Michael sitting on ansated and any S hook Jackson opens up is going to get destroyed. Dup, the play Jackson chooses to make, takes both the S and an E. And now Michael will have to choose which placement of ansated he wants to put down. 
We might see a bingo and then a bingo back, depending on Jackson's pull here. Huge draw. The R helpful, another R not helpful, and the O, that'll be all right. He's got crooner and coroner on that rack and might bingo back. I think he will bingo back no matter what which placement Michael chooses. So we're going to see a bingo, and then we're going to see another one after the play dub. Yeah, yeah, looks like. And that's what I was alluding to earlier is at least Jackson has the benefit of if he does get bingo on, hopefully the bingo gives him a bingo in response. And then we're, we're back to an even game. So even is not what you want to be. You want to be ahead, but it's better than being down. So um, it, it, you just sort of go into the end game with a, a very tight score. And, the, and you know, as commentators, we, we couldn't be happier. We haven't had a ton of close end games here on this stream. Oh, my goodness. So Michael has two choices, and sated and dups for a bunch of points. That one scores 75, but opens huge bingo lines. Or he's got this option that he's putting down, and sated and dupe. This is a much better play. It scores way worse, but you don't want to get bingoed back on. This scores 67. We'll put Michael ahead by 41. You're going to win this game a lot unless your opponent bingos, but Jackson has an awesome play here. Do we see it? So his bingos of crooner and corner don't fit next to Ansated. Um, oh, that is where that you're I'm wrong. Seeing. That is where you're wrong. Crooner fits with six overlaps. Oh, wow. Oh. Duper. Duper, yeah. <laughs> I, I, was just, I was just thinking about it, that you run off the top of the board if you play next to the A, just putting the AR there. Um, but put the other R there, the first R of Crooner, and it still does play. So, yeah, hopefully I would see that in a game situation and not say the first thing that's you know pops into my head like I'm doing on this commentary. Uh, that's, I mean, I think that's a straightforward find for Jackson. He's going to be double checking, you know, where does this bingo play and not play, and I think he'll he'll come to the realization that it does play making six overlaps. The other choice Jackson has to make, should he see this, and I bet he will, is do I play it? There are five tiles in the bag right now. Does this put me ahead by enough that I'll win this endgame? Crooner will put Jackson ahead 427 to 389, and he has found it, the filthy overlap. What? Let's watch Michael's face. Oh, we cut away for a minute. But uh, yeah, yeah, that that can't feel good. You feel like you've made this nice defensive bingo and snuck out this game, and then you get hit with a six overlap. That's going to be a fun postmortem there for sure. So Jackson does drop the bingo. He's going to pull the last five tiles out of the bag, and they are going to be E-E-H-L-O. He is going to seed points back. Uh, the play of Crooner allows Michael to play something like M-I-L and S-O-M and those other overlaps. But Michael, I don't see any out in two sequence with the rack this bag bad. And it looks like Michael with the bingo, Jackson with the counter bingo, Michael with a bad pull, and Jackson with a reasonably balanced one. Jackson going to go on and narrowly escape with this game. And it looks like we were just talking about the L's earlier as possibly being important for Jugal. It took them a while to. Uh tumble out of the bag here, and it might not matter too much uh, what goes on with the L's. Um. Yeah, Michael's going to use the rest of his clock here. If he can go out in two, he might yet be able to make this reasonable, but his rack is just so bad. I don't think it's it's in the cards for him. If I'm Michael too, like I would have held the last play. And even if I'm 98% sure, I'm going to do the math here. If I realize I'm dead, I'm going to challenge duper. Uh, it's probably a word, but I mean, he, he could still be holding like in a, in a, a last turn scenario, you, you get your courtesy tiles pretty quickly. And I mean, I've had games where I just hold for the rest of my clock. I just keep, keep the challenge available to me until I make my play. And so it's quite possible that uh, Jackson is on the indefinite hold here. Yeah, I, I do this all the time as well. Like Michael's got to think a little bit more about things, though. He has to think not just about winning this game, but also the, uh, the spread ramifications of a challenge at this point. Michael's ahead nearly 400 spread points on the field, but taking a loss here, 
if he challenges and turns a 30 point loss into an 80 point loss, uh, this tournament got very interesting. So Michael's got a lot to think about here. How certain is he on duper? Um, how much does spread matter to him versus, you know, if you knock off crooner, you win the game a hundred percent, but that's duper has got to be a word, right? Super duper, unless it isn't. Yeah, exactly. You, you, he's, you know, Michael's a, a top expert. He knows his five letter words, but they can slip out at in inconvenient times, or you can just really not want a word to be a word. Um, sort of a desperation challenge can be called for in situations like this. Uh, do I think it's called for here? No, I don't. I think it, he probably should just play this game out and conserve spread. But there are definitely situations where a word that's 98% good, you, you just take the challenge and hope there's that 2% chance that you're misremembering and that your opponent is also misremembering. Yeah, I mean, everybody's made this mistake one. Where you is good, good, but loses if it's good, and you win for sure if you challenge it, but you're too proud or you don't want to lose a spread, and then you don't, and then it's no good, and you realize you blew the game because you didn't have the cojones to challenge that word. Um, and then after that, you know, your pride goes out the window. You're just you're going to challenge anything if it costs you the game for a while. I don't know. The pride in Scrabble is wild sometimes what people are and aren't willing to do. Some people have no shame and will challenge even the most common words if it costs them the game. Some people have way too much pride and won't challenge almost anything in any situation if they think it's a word. An extra level of complexity to a game that's already completely wild. Michael is going to do everything he can in this situation to try to find an out in two sequence to try to find something exciting. Um, but we know that there's nothing he can do as rack is just so inflexible. If he had found even one of those E's, this might be rather interesting, but he found no help in the bag at all. Um, he doesn't have an E to play mover or Vomer. He's really just got no good sequences. Yeah, it looked like he had Gil set up making Jugal that keeps MORV. He's thinking maybe that does something on the right side of the board. And it does. He can play like OM if it doesn't get blocked. and But then that's still an out in three sequence. And that's probably still not going to be enough. Uh, but yeah, he's, maybe he tries he's something not... like that and hopes Jackson, you know, bungles the end game in some way. I would be shocked if Jackson bungles an endgame on this stage, especially one as straightforward as this. But, hey, I've been shocked by a number of things that have happened already. Um, we saw Daughters, which is very high prob, get held. We saw Obelize get missed. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of stuff, and nothing surprises me anymore. I think priority one for Michael, if he's looking to optimize this end game, is you have to take away SOH from Jackson. SOH and HE alone is a devastating play, or SOH and OH and NOO. You don't want to let Jackson have either of those. So take away the triple word if you can. Um, has to be priority one, assuming you're not going to go out in two. And I just don't see the out in two sequence here for him. Yeah, if he does something like OM and then Gil, I, like he might get V stuck on this board. There's no there's no open vowels to play through, no, no way to um, get rid of the V, so it actually just probably works out worse for him. He's got to be careful here, and he does take the highest scoring play. Um, he does have VAR, VAR, sort of an escape valve for the V, but uh, it's, this isn't going to be quite enough. Yeah, Vomer also plays through the ME at the top, so he's got options to shed the V. He's not going to eat it here, but um, I'm sure this is not the outcome Michael wanted. Although, for those of you who believe in a sense of justice, I do feel Jackson played the better game here. The huge bingo miss of Obelize, double-double natural on top of Squid for Michael ended up being the difference in this game. Yeah, J Jackson had some creative um, board control plays in the middle of the game with Revoice and Yang, which 
worked out exactly as he wanted them to revoice digging into the bag to draw the blank and then that gives him some you know flexibility to counter bingo anything that happens from michael's end so although we did really like michael's play of quid it was a really high level strategic decision but as Matt mentioned earlier, he he got the tiles that he needed to to sort of put the cap on that play and uh, didn't put the cap on it. So we see Jackson just go with Hod, his highest scoring play. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I think that will give him, yeah, he has at least heal to, or eel on top of daughters to go out. So... Michael's going to either have to play VAR or Vomer uh, to get rid of the V, and uh, the game will come to an end. And he's going to instead play LO, um, which is one point worse in terms of in game valuation than Vomer, but at this point, one point, not such a big deal. What a game! Back and forward, Jackson opens the line, hoping Michael can't bingo. Michael does bingo, and then Jackson hits him back with a six overlap. Michael's got to feel okay knowing, hey, I was dead either way. If I play and sated in the more aggressive spot, Jackson's still going to bingo on me um, for a lot of points. So I was going to get bingoed on no matter what I did, and I was going to lose probably no matter what I did. But... At the same time, man, that's that's a bad beat. You play the defensive bingo, and I think Michael was right in choosing the defensive placement of Ansated and just got burned very, very hard um, with a low probability outcome. I bet Michael's probably at least 70% to win after Ansated and uh, ended up losing anyway. Yeah, kind of a tough break for him. Um, we, we could see it sort of all unfold from our position, seeing both players' racks. Um, so we could sort of see it coming, but... From Michael's POV, sort of a bad break. Yeah, it's always so much easier to play Scrabble in the commentator's box, too. You've got your anagrammer. You can look up hooks. You can uh, you know, run things through Quackle and find the nines and everything else. It is so much harder over the board with no tools at your disposal except your brain. Yeah, and for some of us, the, the brain is not as good a tool as we wish it was. Uh, I am certainly a part of that club. Shout out, small brain gang, I guess. So Jackson's going to go out with Eel, catch 10 points on Michael's rack. I have a final of 474 to 439, so a narrow win for Jackson. We'll cut to overhead Mike here. I mean, I already know. It's definitely more than four. I think I can, but it's probably not going to I'm almost sure of both. I'm pretty sure if Duper is good. Duper is good. I didn't want to go uh, anti there. So it's a lot easier for you to go back, I think. But when I do, I don't want to ask much. Because you do get the uh, My thing? I guess you're a thing with the GS a lot. 
score like because you want to open them. So this does walk a lot. Pretty lucky. Yeah, it's pretty hard. And that was pretty clear. That was incredible. Uh, can't say it would be any seven ending it. But again, if you play in six two, you can probably outrun most seven two because they don't score anything and they do a ten point game. You probably win if you bingo here. The only problem with NCAA here is bingo here. Which is my it depends on the pool. Yeah, I think we can the pool. I think we can get 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 the pool. I think we I mean, that was my goal with Duff. Like, I knew what Duff was setting up for a good thing, but I was hoping I could go back and score. Because I hated the. Uh, yeah, I hate all my offense. Oh, I just looked. Oh, I just looked. He looks like a calm. But yeah, he just seems. What did Quincy? He has. What else? I think it's another eye. Yes, I have. If I would help, like an N or a Well, it's definitely an L in an overlap picture. Oh, yeah. That's a good play. I mean, I was so happy with Shane, but as soon as you play that, it's a good Oh yeah. And then we go to the block of Bingo. Well, oh yeah, that was my goal. Yeah, I like that the scene made you seven of the Yeah, that makes a lot of good things. Much, much harder to bingo. You know, you're like, when you're supposed to like to do that. All right, so in the matchup between the two former North American champions from Montreal, Jackson Smiley taking the W in dramatic fashion at the end of that game. You hear the banter after the game. Uh, Michael asking, is Obelize good? Jackson saying no immediately. And then me texting Jackson saying, uh, yes, it is. And both players like, oh, oh, oh. So uh, lots of spicy stuff going on there. But the word knowledge a little shaky at the top of Division One in the NWL field. We, uh, as I mentioned in the chat, we do have to continue waiting for every game to finish before we can get pairings for the next round to make sure pairings are as accurate as possible. We are predicting a wait of about five to seven minutes as we get the rest of those done. I'm sure there's going to be some recount somewhere. In the interim, I do have something y'all can do. If you haven't yet, hit the like button on this video. Let's bump us up the algorithm, get more people stumbling into competitive Scrabble. Share this video around. Subscribe to Let's Play Scrabble and uh, you'll get more Scrabble content from other tournaments like this if you want to check out tournaments near you. Let'sPlayScrabble.com has a lot of information about upcoming tournaments, and uh, if you want to watch more Scrabble on the internet, check out Charles, now that we just took down the overlay. Um, ancient Cosmographer on Twitch, we had Austin uh, Shin. Uh, that was right on cue. That was actually really awesome. We had uh, Austin Shin yesterday, Austinio7. I believe was the handle. Um, Austinio9. Austinio9. Indeed. Uh, well, somebody drop it in chat. Heidi Robertson, uh, she streams as well. Heidi, you can drop your info in chat. Uh, Josh Sokol is Axer Typo. Got lots of Scrabble streamers out there. You can play competitive Scrabble on woogles.io as well as other board or word games. Um, and uh, with that, Oh, I just heard from our producer that he's got to step away. So we're going to stay live for just a little bit. Uh, we will cut to a break so I can go get some more coffee. And we will have additional Scrabble, depending on how things shake up. 
uh, we will either bring you NWL or CSW. I have no idea, and these decisions are above my pay grade. But as we wait, I'm looking at some standings. Michael Fagan and Jackson Smiley, now both 10 and 3 atop this NWL division, though Fagan substantially ahead on spread. Um, Jason Lee, one game behind them at 9 and 4, and Jeremy Hall, if he is able to defeat Dean Herget, will also be at nine and four, one game behind them. In the CSW lexicon, we have some drama unfolding as well. We saw Ben Schoenbrunn jump out to a 10 and 0 start. Ben Schoenbrunn is now 10 and three. Josh Sokol is 10 and three. Matthew O'Connor is 10 and three. And Jason Keller is 10 and three. So likely all four of those guys are going to play, and whoever able to go 2-0 and out of that field is going to win this CSW division. We are going to cut to a break while they do the calculus and figure out who's playing who. I guess we bring you a Collins game, but I cannot make any promises. It will go in chat as soon as we have additional information. But with that, we're going to cut away. Y'all don't go anywhere, and we will be back in five to seven minutes with additional Scrabble for y'all. See you soon.
All right. Well, sorry for interrupting those of you bopping to that music, but we are back with additional Scrabble. Two games to play from Lake George, New York. I am Matt Canick, joined by Charles Ranke, and we will be guiding you through these last two games. As I alluded to before the break, it is crunch time in this CSW division. We have four players with identity the field, the way pairings are going to work. We're going to see two of those players play each other and the other two players play each other. And then the winners of those two games will duke it out for the championship spread will not matter unless we see a tie in one of these games. We're going to see Matthew O'Connor versus Ben Schoenbrunn. And I'll go ahead and warn our audience right now. This is a, this is going to be a brutal game to watch because both of these players invoke Benji mode on their racks. They take their tiles and they turn them sideways, upside down, all the different orientations. So we're all going to be uh, practicing some neck exercises here. Get those uh, get those 90 degree bends up and ready to go because this is going to be a fun one. All right. Um, the players are wandering the playing room. I'm hearing from production team. Uh, so Matthew will be back very shortly, but we'll take you to our over the board action where Ben Again, started this tournament 10 and 0, has dropped three straight. He looks to reverse his fortunes here. It is still anybody's tournament at this point. It is so hard though. Starting 10 and 0 and losing three straight. This is a uh, this is hard. Charles, how do you overcome that psychology? Stay out of the negative and remain positive in this situation. Uh, honestly, I think I could ask my brother that question. He had a division two of nationals where I believe he started 16 and one and then dropped seven straight. He was just cruising to an absolutely dominant victory in that division and lost seven in a row. Um, I think his mental state was okay. Um, he had a big buffer to lose games and lose games he did. And so Ben might be feeling the same way. He, he got off to a great start. I'm sure he would, if you asked him, he would acknowledge the, the role that the tile draws played in his 10 and 0 start. And he's just fully aware that uh, the universe is equalizing. Um, but he, he did give himself that buffer. And so you still feel pretty good. You know you're a good enough player to win 10 in a row. Uh, if your luck evens out a little bit more, can easily win these last two and win the tournament. Well, let's see if Ben can shake it off and uh, reverse his fortunes here. We're going to cut back to the board as Matthew has found his way back to his chair. And we are ready to go here. <coughs> Excuse me. Ben to play first, Matthew to respond. We'll see. I just want a good game of Scrabble. We've had a lot of drubbings at this tournament, but we've had a couple good ones. Matthew, I think, giving us our best game of the tournament in a win yesterday over Joshua Castellano and Ben to go first here. You can already see Benji mode is a go as we've got a sideways T, a sideways V the other way. It is Benji mode here at Lake George, New York. And I think he's got yet yeah, VVIJNRT. This is an instant exchange, right, Charles? Yeah, and there's no question. You can't get rid of both Vs. You can barely get rid of one V. You can get rid of the J and keep two Vs. None of that is worth doing. Probably exchange JVV here. Um, you have to do some analysis on leave quality, but maybe keeping INT, uh, but TINR, good synergy. I think this is the right exchange. Yeah, I think you hold INRT as well. Um, so VVJ, the exchange for Ben on the first turn. And Matthew has an interesting choice now. A-A-G-I-N-S-S, -S, his rack. So he is also invoking Benji mode here. And after an exchange three, that can mean a couple different things. But typically, if your opponent wants to hold four of those tiles, they're pretty good tiles. INRT is actually kind of a lower end outcome. You expect things like EIRT fairly often, AERT as well, or God forbid a blank or an S on their rack. So if you're Matthew, you don't want to give a lot of floaters, you assume that uh, your opponent's quite close to bingo range and every letter you give your opponent gives more chances for an eight letter word. I think we're gonna see exchange one from Matthew O'Connor here. And as much as I would love to exchange that diagonal S, uh, it's gonna probably be an exchange of an A here if I had to guess. Matthew's gonna think long and hard about this one. Um, but I think exchange one, exchange A is the move here. What say you, Charles? Uh, I like either exchange A or exchange AS, honestly. Certainly playing through after an exchange three from Ben 
is not what you want to do if you're Matthew. Uh, you, you don't, as Matt said, you don't want to give uh, letters for bingos, especially considering that all of the letters that Matt has are good bingo letters. Aside from perhaps the G, any letter that he puts out there is going to make Ben's life easier, not harder. So we do see an exchange one. I think we agree with this, just exchanging the A. Now Ben has a choice. Does he make a play like, uh, I think bitor is a word, B-I-T-T-O-R, or does he just counter exchange again? Uh, we'll see what he decides. Man, Bitor gives four very lucrative floaters for your opponent, but exchange one, your opponent has a seven a lot of the time, but Bitor, your opponent, almost certain to bingo. If they missed the seven, they'll hit the eight. The other thing to think about here is Matthew did spend over a minute and a half before exchanging. And if you know anything about Matthew O'Connor, you know the book is that he is a very fast player. So what made him spend so much time? Why was that such a hard exchange? Uh, anyway, Ben exchanges again, which I do think makes sense in the situation, given the context. And then Matthew did pick up his seven. Massing is going to come down into the assign leave. And Matthew's going to jump out to a lead. After three turns of nothing, we see a big score here for Matthew O'Connor. And Ben, A-I-N-O-R-R-T, the lead or the the pull here for him. Are you seeing any bingos here, Charles? Uh, I'm off the top of my head. I am not. I'm thinking an E would be great for anterior. And if you're Ben, you're thinking, oh, certainly I'm going to get an E if my opponent's bingoing. They've got to be giving me an E, right? Uh, but not in this case. And uh, so I don't see anything that plays. I think we've got Quackle up, and we were confirming that there are no pl playable bingos for Ben, which is. Uh, kind of a tough break, but he's going to spend some time here to make sure that that's the case. I think this goes back to his last play. I don't know that I was a fan of holding on to the O. I think I prefer to hold I-N-R-T to I-N-R-T-O. Maybe I'm crazy, but, um, you know, that O just doesn't seem to synergize particularly well with the rest of those tiles. And this is what's ended up happening here. I'm actually going to put up, uh, pull up the uh, cross tables leave evaluator. We're going to actually get some numbers on this. Um, yeah, let's go to school. INORT has a value of 9.4, INRT 7.5. So I guess in a vacuum, INORT actually does have enough synergy to evaluate slightly better. And that might also be because you only draw two tiles to it rather than three. So yeah. uh, kind of a close, a close call there. Ben's got to make a really hard choice now. It's so easy to get, you know, tunnel vision. I've been trying to bingo for two turns with these small exchanges. Um, now I just want to drop OR somewhere, right? Play GOR. He can also score 25 right now by playing a Roint and a Massing, should he notice that hook. So he can blow it all up, score 25 now and say, forget about it. Or he can keep things tight and small, play OR or O-A-R and amassing if he wants to hold that I-N-R-T leave one more time. What would you do here? Would you blow it all up? Would you play long and score points? Or would you make a smaller intermediate play? Uh, at this point, given the, the score, I would probably make this a smaller intermediate play. Um, a roint doesn't net you enough points to justify the fact that you're basically leaving your bingo chances to complete chance. Um, Ben putting the R here, playing both R's for Roar, I actually don't know if I agree with that. There's tons of E's in the bag to make the INRT leave extremely compelling. And uh, he's also got the ING for, from the G in amassing. And drawing one more tile just makes it more likely that you draw a clunker, the, the V that he already saw earlier, the J, the Q. Um, I like OR better than Roar for sure. Yeah, I would not play Roar. If I'm going to do this, I'd play Or. Um, but Ben plays more Roar, and Matthew is going to whiff on a bingo this turn, um, which is uh, wow. uncharacteristic for players of this caliber at this tier. And he went pretty quick on that, too. The bingo played through the G at the bottom of the board. Mute this now if you want to take some more time to look for it. The bingo was Biograph, and he's going to get punished very, very hard for his mistake as Ben has pulled the Z and is going to drop it down for 71 points, Z-E-I-N. That Z is so, 
so powerful, especially in the CSW lexicon and uh, been demonstrating exactly why. So a frustrating start, you expect when you exchange down to INRT, you're going to bingo sometime in the first like four or five turns of the game and Ben still hasn't done so, but Zine has to be a pretty good consolation prize for him as he pulls back close into this game, 88 to 103. And Matthew has not found good tiles after his missed bingo last turn. The leave of AIPR met with AEI on the poll, not what he was looking for. And he's going to have himself a challenging turn here. AIA seems to make the most sense to play off. You can do that playing NAN and GI, or you can score one more point playing it just to the left of amassing N and AG. But the second placement, the one that scores one more, gives a ton of options back to your opponent. What are you looking to do here, Charles? Uh, definitely, and we, we saw this in the first game of the day where AIA is just such a helpful word in Collins. Uh, NWL viewers will be um, aghast and probably a little bit envious to find out about the existence of that word. Um, in terms of where I would play it, certainly playing it to the left of amassing, uh, scoring one more point, you know, in a vacuum that's better but setting up that huge triple letter score where basically every high scoring letter uh, works nicely in that spot. You, you just don't want to do something like that. So I'm, I'm thinking slotting it in between amassing and zine. Uh, you can even play it to the right of zine, set up another easy bingo lane for yourself. Um, part of the idea with AIA would be to keep bingo prone tiles. And the point of, you know, keeping bingo prone tiles is you need a spot to bingo once you draw the bingo with your bingo prone tiles. So uh, that would be an option as well. Hard turns. These turns are always super hard. Um, when you're kind of close to bingos, how much do I need to groom my rack? How, you know, do I want to keep the best possible leave of AEPR? Am I okay holding an eye to go with that? Is it better to hold an eye to go with that? Do I want to score 22 or 10? These are so hard, these turns right here, these intermediate turns. And yet these are what separate the cream of the crop from everybody else. Anybody can sit there and learn 20,000 sevens and eights. There's a lot of people who have, but you've got to learn how to play the game and play it tactically as well. Yeah, and uh, you, can, you can tell that this is uh, requiring some thinking from Matthew because he, he basically insta-played Bo, B-O-H, missing a bingo. Uh, he is not insta-playing something here. He is taking his time to evaluate the board and his leaves and the score. Everything that you have to combine to make the correct play. Here it's not clear-cut. Uh, here is a good spot to spend some time, although we always caution, don't get bogged down here in the early game. Don't use too much of your clock when you'll need it for tough end game calculations, possibly at the end. I love doing commentary on Scrabble on exactly these turns because I would sit there over the board and just like pull my hair out, have no idea what to do. Think about all the ways each of my options is going to backfire on me. If I play AIA on the left, I know I'm gonna get hit with like some dumb W play for 40 points. If I play AIA on the right, I know I'm going to draw an unplayable bingo next turn. If I end up scoring 30 or 30, or, you know, 20 or 25 out of this turn and blowing up the rack, I know I'm going to draw UUV. So, you know, it's hard not to get in your own head in the game of Scrabble. And these turns are so aggravating. And I just, I like being in the commentator booth. I don't have to make these decisions anymore. I'm a lot more comfortable here sipping my coffee and telling other people what they should or shouldn't do. Oh, so he, he's, I, I, I kind of like this from Matt. He is completely blowing up the rack. He, he evaluated that the leaves he can keep are not good enough to justify, you know, the closed board and the low scores. He's just going to play as many tiles as he can and hopefully, you know, blanks, blanks and S's. That's, that's the goal with a play like this. So Prairie the play, and this is something too that shows some of the interesting schools of thought across the years in Scrabble. Back in the 1980s, uh, tile turnover was all the rage. Play as many tiles as I can, try to draw the blanks, because if I get both blanks, I'm not going to lose. 
And then in the 1990s, early 2000s, especially with the advent of computer analysis, we saw actually don't play a lot of tiles, but keep all the good ones. A lot of the tiles in the bag are bad. Hold on to A-E-R-T, E-I-R-T, groom your rack and try to bingo twice a game, three times a game. If you do, you're not going to lose. And so we actually saw a shift over to smaller plays very often. And probably in my opinion, what was overfishing in the Scrabble scene where now we're playing too small and too tight and everybody's just trying to bingo all day. And Matthew's play a little bit of a refreshing shift back to the old guard. I'm going for turnover again. I'm not getting bogged down with these one pointers that don't score. Give me some letters that I can get some points with. And he has found one by drawing the X here. Ben is a hard turn, but he's likely just going to play off a lot of these tiles as we saw last turn from Matthew. All of these score one. You hate scoring 20 points in a Collins game where the average points per move is what, like 40, something like that, 42. So, you know, you got to get rid of some of this stuff and work through it or you must bingo next turn. You could fish OO here or Ben was looking to play Oolite. Uh, it's anagram Thule also plays to that E. I think you've got to play a six to the E in this situation here. You can't get caught up fishing and Ben seems to agree with Oolite. Do you like this play, Charles? Yeah, I think this this is clearly the correct play. Fishing nets you very few points if you play off OO. The EIL and T leave, while it's pretty good on this board, not a lot of floaters for eight letter words, which might be the strength of that leave. So maybe a little bit pointless here. We, he's kind of doing the same thing that Matthew did last turn, which is just play a bunch of tiles. Score basically as good as you can and hope for things to look up for you in the future. I wonder if an OO fish making OI and OR made some sense. That leaves this board very open. It holds the ING combination to try to hit a massing, but I am almost always anti-fishing. That's my personal uh, philosophy and approach to this game. Uh, I wouldn't do it. I like this play of Oolite. Just get through this stuff. Let me find tiles that score points and let me score points with them. Now, Ben hasn't found tiles that score points. He's found all one pointers yet again. But despite not fishing, he's found a bingo, A-N-E-S, A-E-N-E-O-U-S. So he'll be scoring big points next turn. And Matthew, I don't know what he's thinking about here. To me, it looks so obviously apparent that you play AX and XI to the left side of Prairie. I would have made that play within four seconds. Matthew, typically a fast player. What do you think he's thinking about here, Charles? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in the dark on this one too. Uh, AX is quite straightforward. Oh, he, no, this is actually a decent idea. He probably figures the X spot will stay open next turn and he's shedding some of the clunkier stuff. I'd be interested okay. to see how that sims, but uh, that's a decent idea. Yeah, I'm not going to run the sim right now. I'm going to try to stay on with the coverage, but I am very curious about that. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I wonder, too, we've seen several word knowledge mistakes from Ben already. And Yura does not take an S. It takes two back hooks, an L and an N, but does not take an S. So perhaps this is a little bit of bait. Matthew trying to set a trap here, too. Um, but Ben draws into Aeneas. He's going to play it in the spot that scores the most points. He can also play it for 72 instead of the 74 he gets for this one by making Anuran. Or he can play it for 70 on top, making AR and playing from the R and Roar. Um, but this is his highest scoring option, albeit a little bit dangerous. But I think you, you probably grab the points in this situation. And Ben... Going to bingo halfway through the game with two unseen blanks. If he's able to draw one here, he's going to be at a big advantage in this game. What's he found? He's found one of those Vs he exchanged on the first turn, and Matthew's got the other. they got to shake this bag a little more, I think. And a bunch of garbage. Wow. Ouch. Okay. Yeah, so both players are a bit bogged down here. Well, Matthew's got the VG combo. Ben's got the VU combo plus a bunch of junk. Uh, it might be a couple turns before we see another bingo, but we, we like these short tactical plays as well. Possibly more interesting to commentate than just bingo, 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 game's over. Nobody had to think this is a bit more exciting. 
Yeah, uh, some people do play Scrabble so that they can think. Some people just like spelling cool words. Everybody has a different reason to play this game. Me, I hate myself, and that's why I play Scrabble. I love the punishment. I love that feeling of drawing three U's and a W. It just makes me feel really good. Yeah, I mean, Matt, if it makes you feel good, is that really punishment? It's some sort of perverse uh, sadomachic. I'm not going to say it, but you know what I'm getting at. I do know what you're getting at. Perhaps I'm just a glutton for punishment. I don't know. Uh, speaking of punishment, here is that X play. Matthew did not cash this in last turn, but he is going to drop AXED this turn. Look at that leave. VGT, and they're all oriented in different directions. So if he can find a tile that is placed pointing to the right, he will complete the Benji bingo and uh, get b uh, letters in every different direction. Benji mode activated. All right, oh, Axe comes down, 42 points. We have a tie game, 183 to 183. What was the point of those first six turns for each of us? We are right back in the thick of it now. B-M-O-P-T-U-V is the rack for Ben. He has 43 points available. Typically in CSW, when you see EX, you're looking at putting the O behind it to make XO, but the O actually needs to go on the other side of EX for his best play here. T-O-M-B, making Tex and one, scores 43. The V-U-P leave is awful but 43 is so good. You've got to play it, right? Yeah, you, you, you've got to take the points. Uh, PUV might be right up there with the worst leaves that we've seen kept at this tournament. I guess I can't bring to mind a complete list of those leaves, but PUV, that is just crushingly bad. Uh, your, your next turn valuation just completely goes in the toilet with a, a leaf like that. But on this board, th there's some points available. You take those points. Yeah, you've got to grab points here, especially after the play I think we're going to see from Matthew next turn. These points are going to be very valuable. So the play from Ben puts him ahead by 43, and Matthew now has found the first blank in the bag, but not a lot of goodies to go with it. E-G-I-J-T-V blank on his rack. And uh, I think Jiver to the R in Prairie is the best move here. It seems a little bit wild if you're Matthew to block almost every floater on this board when you're in bingo range and your opponent just took a long time to make what looks like a very obvious play of tomb. Uh, to me, that says my opponent aggravated over this, um, did not want to make this play and probably has a bad leave because of it. So I'm in bingo range. I don't think my opponent does. I don't want to block the floaters, but this rack is just so inflexible. E G I J T V blank like I think you have to play Jiger. I just don't see many other compelling options to score points. If you want to be nuts and give us some stream content, though, J A and Jive down at the bottom of the board would be fun, albeit very stupid. Yeah, that that's kind of an indefensible play. I actually like. Uh, I was going to say I like Jig making J A next to Anura, keeping E T V. With the O and the I open of Oolite, that actually probably bingos a fair amount of the time. Meanwhile, the leave that Matt is keeping here of EGTV blank, uh, somewhat uh, dismal bingoing, bingo letters. You score more points with this position of jig, but sacrifice some bingo chances. The benefit of the other positioning of jig is it sets up an S hook for you. Uh, the board is quite short on S hooks, given that Enura does not take an S. Yeah, so uh, Matthew proving there is no God in Scrabble, only pain as he picks up QY. He would have needed a nice draw to find a bingo there, but QY is about as insulting as it gets. So Matthew may be going to send this one right back to the kitchen. Or, oh, this is a word, Q-U-Y-T-E. Is that what that is, Charles? Oh, uh, yeah, that must be the play here. Uh, uh, that is not a word. Uh, that's why it's catching us a little bit off guard. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm in the wrong lexicon. It is a word. I gotta get my Zizvo to Collins. Um, so horrible leave, um, but is cashing in the blank for, for bingo. So with those bad letters, uh, certainly worth it.
Yeah, yeah. Clearing away the best play for Matthew there. It's going to give back QI plays to Ben, and this is going to be a test of his word knowledge. Does he know a bunch of random sixes? Because he's got several that will play beneath that Q. Um, he's got Plutei, P-L-U-T-E-I. He's got its anagram Putelei, P-U-T-E-L-I. And he's got the six letter L-O-U-P-I-T. Each of those plays beneath quite for either 35 or 36 points. You've got to do that, right, Charles? Yeah, definitely. The 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 singular hot spot on this board is the spot underneath the QI or making QI. Uh, Q U Y T E does take a D and an S, but Ben doesn't have any way to address that spot. At least not not in any way that scores any decent amount of points. So. Playing underneath, certainly a good idea here. Tulip is also uh, a reasonable choice. Gets a little more uh, points on the scoreboard by using the P there. Uh, OE, kind of a neutral leaf, so Tulip looks pretty good as well. This is going to be crazy. I think we're going to see something I've never seen before in my life. Uh, Matthew cashed in one blank on a 70-point non-bingo last turn. He might do it again this turn, a W blank DY and quite it plays for 60. The blank would be an A, W, A, D, Y. Um, so Matthew may burn both blanks in consecutive non-bingo plays. And it's not like the board is, you know, lacking bingo lines. It's just Matthew's racks have been so abysmal that he has no chance to bingo, but he has chances to score points. So what do you think, Charles? Burn the second blank to take a 50-point lead with Weighty? Or do you look elsewhere and maybe play just VID and Quited? Do you look to a different quadrant of the board completely? Do you play VIG above Tulip? But this is hard. What would you do? Uh, so Quite was uh, pretty straightforward because the Q has no future really on this board. If you can score 70-ish points with it, you do it. Um, Math, Matthew's letters here, while not very good, do have a small amount of future that the Q does not have. Like, the Q is just so bad. Meanwhile, if uh, Matthew plays VID and quieted, WGY has a decent chance of scoring next turn and keeps the blank. Uh, so it, it would be a close call for me. He does not do either play. He might be keeping the D back for quieted plays next turn. That is a little bit dangerous given the amount of Ds in the pool. Um, and we see Ben just immediately pounce on that spot. So possibly, maybe not a wrong play from Matthew, but it didn't work out for him. Uh, just too many Ds for that play to make sense. I think Matthew needed to play weighty last turn and he's gonna get hit back now by Ben. Ben takes the lead with that play, 36 points for undo. This EEO leave is spicy, but now everything makes sense. We see the challenge on Quieted. So Matthew wasn't sure on that word, and that certainly changes the calculus on a play like Weighty. If it does come back, you've given your opponent all this free information that you have the blank. Uh, yeah, you can't pull the trigger on Weighty unless you're certain it's a word. So Vig, with this challenge, makes more sense. Ben's going to pick up five additional points as in the CSW lexicon, that's how we do challenges. Five points if you're wrong, not a lost turn. Matthew's gonna get to make a play anyway this turn. F-I-D-G-W-Y blank, geez, they are gonna run out of tiles that score a lot of points in this game eventually. They have just had so many of these ugly high scoring tiles, uh, you know, BOH, Tomb, and the last several plays, uh, for sure. I'll try to get the Unseen Pool displayed if Matthew doesn't play quickly here, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. So when we get this pool on display, you'll see a number of things. Um, there are only two vowels unseen to Matthew that are not E's. There are six E's unseen, um, and an A, and an O, and that is it. He has already the last I. He has a bunch of these consonants. There's a lot more consonants in the bag, and the only relief he'll find is an E, probably. So you need to be thinking about what consonants am I keeping, 
And when I do draw an E, what, what is that going to give me? These are wild situations. It's always fascinating to watch players adjust or fail to adjust their game based on the unseen pool. But this one's a rather interesting one. What would you do with this pool, with all of those E's unseen and very few scoring consonants? Uh, Charles? Uh, at first glance, uh, all those E's in the bag do, do make the D on Matthew's rack more valuable for ED bingos. But it's worth noting that there is not an easy place to play an ED seven-letter word on this board. And as I'm looking at the available bingo spots, I'm thinking that that Y actually does have uh, an uncommon um, usefulness here because it plays next to the U of undo, making U. And so that's really one of the few remaining spots for seven-letter words is if you could uh, get one ending in a Y. So keeping the Y here makes a little bit more sense than it usually does. And Gauff is a, a good way to get rid of some of those clunky letters. The G and the F we've discussed before, they don't like each other. The W and the G don't like each other. Playing all of those off is a good thing. Unfortunately, blocks some of the more lucrative bingo spots as well, which Matthew does not want to do. Let's check out this unseen pool. It's about to come on display. This is wild for Ben. What's missing, Charles? Well, I mean, the Q is missing, but all, all, those, all those vowels are <laughs> sitting on Ben's rack. They are not in the pool. This is a situation where you have to be like, oh my god, I'm so angry. I just drew this terrible rack. And then you look at what's unseen and you're like, this is gold. This is an absolutely golden rack. So oh, I don't think you can put the A down here if you're Ben. You need to retain your vowels, especially the case A here. It's so valuable. I think you play Olay. This is also free information for Matthew. Matthew now knows I am not getting another vowel this game, more than likely, as... A play like Olia through an L indicates you're probably holding three more vowels. Uh, I would not have put the A on the end of this play. I would have thought a lot harder about the pool. Uh, I would have done a lot of different things, but maybe Ben hasn't noticed just how unbalanced the unseen pool is. I think that was a rushed turn, and this may cost Ben big time. Yeah, definitely. Even just from the perspective, you keep the A, you just get more flexibility that three E's does not give you. It's, and Ben um, found the last E in the bag as well, so this is oh, even wow. crazier. So Matthew comes back very quickly with D-I-D-Y. This is crucial that he doesn't play off his I and that he's able to score points. There's only one vowel left for Matthew to find. Uh, in the bag, now that we've seen Ben drew another E, C E E E E F L, the rack for Ben, and we'll work on getting unseen displayed again to y'all uh, from his perspective. Yeah, the, the only saving grace for Matthew here is he does have the blank. Uh, he's probably thinking at this point, that's not going to help me bingo. There's no point thinking about bingos or very minimal point thinking about bingos. I just need to use this blank to score enough points to win a tight end game, which we are indeed in a tight game. Only a three point lead for Ben. Uh, this is shaping up to be an exciting finish. All right, check me on my word knowledge, Charles. Did they take away the front hook to F-A-Y? Uh, yes, they did. We're not gonna say the word out loud, but that word is gone. That word is gone, okay. So, Ben, I think, once again, a rush decision here. Just kind of playing flea. You have 11 minutes. There's a wild bag situation. I, I'm going to not say anything else, but I think maybe Ben needs to take more time on this turn. Flea for 19 is going to be his move. Yeah, I, I think it, it might end up being the correct move. I do think he could take a little bit more time here. Then again, there's not many spots to play on this board at this point. We've we've seen with Vig and Jig and and uh, Didi coming down, you're, you're just sort of out of spots to score. And the only other place he might be looking at is possibly playing Cleep, C-L-E-E-P, to the P of Prairie. Otherwise, your scoring options are limited. 
I mean, you can't play cleep, you can't string that E out in a way that lets my opponent play a bunch of consonants and score points. There are two tiles left in the bag in this game. Uh, Matthew trails by 22. It is his turn. He has the blank on his rack, and I am trying to figure out if there's anything he can do, Hail Mary-wise, to, to catch back up into this game. But that pool is so bad. His rack is so bad. So uh, one thought I have, which we know might not work out for him, but could work out from Matthew's perspective, is just playing Kit, K-I-T, on top of Vig, going for, like, Thistle with an E-draw, making Skit. Um, that has sort of an out, outside chance of working out, but Ben's going to try to disrupt that if he's able to. So it, it's it's an option. Do I think it's a really good or likely option? No, but maybe it's his only option. I'm not sure at this point. So Kit is going to lose even if he picks up that E. Thistle's just not going to... Uh, it, it's going to get blocked because Ben is going to have the S, but Thistle wins maybe if Matthew draws the S. So maybe Matthew has to just pray that the S is in the bag um, and that he fishes a K, draws the S, the S and he plays Kit. Well... What can Ben do to block? He can't make a J-A or J-O play. There's no A's and no O's. Uh, I think he could this do something is... like J-E-E, -E, um, but I don't think that gives back eights. I'd have to run it, but um, that would be an option to at least try to disrupt it. Instead, we see Matthew play just text, which you know is a good one-tile fish other than what does he hit. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's anything he can hit at this point in the game, especially knowing what we know about Ben's rack. But um, Ben now going to have an interesting choice of his own to make here. The equity play is the four letter E-C-C-E -E, um, playing next to F-E, but there's no way you can make that play with an H on your opponent's rack. It's worth noting here that uh, neither player needs to bingo. Like Matt, Matthew could just outscore in the end game and win. And text <clears throat> might be just his way of starting to score enough points to win an end game outright without a bingo. We'll get the unseen pool displayed from Ben's perspective. This is one where he will definitely take some time after a play like text. You know, obviously my opponent is sitting on this blank. You wouldn't do that otherwise. Uh, but is there any threat that I'm worried about? What is his highest scoring option here? Can he bingo? Do I need to block a bingo? Uh, lots going on for Ben in his head right now. Uh, this is a challenging position. But according to the computer, Ben has 200% wins and one of them make any sense so i'm gonna to have to try to learn some words i don't know collins well enough to understand why this makes sense quackle wants oh i see okay quackle really likes a one tile fish from ben here it wants him to extend a w e to a w e e for seven and I think the reason it likes that is because Ben bingos a decent amount of the time. Obviously, he picks up the blank, he'll bingo. If he picks up the H, he has screech and texts for like 110. And I don't even know that Matthew can block that without burning the blank for like nothing. Quackle's got one other 100% win for Ben. This one makes a lot more sense. Um, it is just SEC and texts, and apparently that is enough. But Ben has a lot to think about here. If there's not a bingo that's coming down in this game, I need to go out next turn to maximize my chances of winning this game. So whatever I play now, I'm going to draw one tile, and I need to figure out how I can go out with that one tile next turn. If I play creep to the P in Prairie, I'm going to hold on to SEC, what are the one tile draws I can pull? The H, the I, the K, the L, the N, the R, the T, and the blank. What can I do with each of those? Can I go out next turn? Matthew, obviously going to be looking to do his own out into, 
Um, so Ben needs to beat him out and try to catch him with some of that stuff on his rack, the H or the K, or at least force him to play off both the H and the K um, and go out next turn. This is a very tough situation for Ben. The engine says this game is won, but we are not engines over the Scrabble board. We are people with brains and no calculators, and we can't see all the options that quickly. Lots for Ben to think about here. Yeah, it looks like he has um, Cersei set up, C-E-R-C-I to the Eye of Prairie, which I think would be a ploy to try to go out in two, um, making texts and uh, something like something, a four letter word there next turn. That seems to be, he's leaning towards it. He was getting ready to play it. Um, he also probably draws uh, a few outs on top of the R of Cersei. So, but he would need to figure out, is that enough to win? Does Matthew have something high scoring that nullifies my out and two sequence? And as Matt mentioned, at this point, you kind of do have to go through each letter in the bag. There's not too many in the bag. It's eight. You still have to do a lot of work, a full amount of work, just to figure out, you know, the percent of winning. He probably by double checking his tracking, making sure he understands which letters enable him to win the game. And if it's not enough of those letters, try to find something else that, you know, wins more often. So you got to look through each of those eight unseen tiles for Ben. If you play C-E-R-C-I, you're holding E-E-S. If you pull the blank, you're going to win. If you pull the H, you've got two plays. You've got she down to this R. If you pull the I, well, Matthew's rack is so bad, you're, you're probably going to win, but that might be lazy analysis. If you draw the K, you have seek or ski, S-K-E-E, -E, in multiple spots, you're going to win if you draw that. If you draw the L, you have seal, S-E-E-L, in text, that's going to win. The N is going to give you Esna or seen, that's going to win. The R, seer, seer, that's going to win. The T, uh, what's going to happen if you draw the T? Well, you've got steer after this, you've got steep. Um, does T-E-E-S play anywhere? I don't know. Matthew may be able to abstract the uh, the out on that one, but we know what's in the bag. It's the N, and Ben's going to be very happy to draw that. I think Ben is on hold here. He hasn't drawn his tile, but has hit his clock. And of course, Matthew's going to do his math. I don't know this word 100%. If this costs me the game, I've got to challenge it, right? Um, so Matthew's going to do the math. He's down 18. He's going to do his tracking. Realize E-E-N-S is on Ben's rack. Realize he has no chance to win as E-S-N-E and -E texts is an awesome outplay for Ben. And uh, that's going to be the end for this one. Yeah, what's what's best? Matthew's best play here? Is it just hiker and <clears throat> keep um, LRT and just... Uh, kind of roll over. Uh, the best play for Matthew takes away Ben's best out of Esna and texts for 27. Oh, yes. So yep. I'll give you that puzzle and see who can figure it out from here. This was a, a really interesting game, and people who play more NWL who are watching looks a lot like an NWL game. It doesn't look as much like the cons games that we're used to seeing. A lot of really tight, overlapping plays, not just a uh, bingo bonanza like a cons game can sometimes turn out to be. Uh, so this is a uh, a cannon fired across, you know, the ship towards all Collins naysayers that there's no strategy involved with Collins. They're, they're, games like this can get very tight and very tactical. Oh yeah, there's no strategy in Collins is, is a huge lie. I mean, after watching the, the world championship and commenting every single game on it, man, there was some brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah, sometimes your opponent just scores 550 and it feels like that happens a lot, but at the same time, strategy is by no means dead in this game, not at all. There's the challenge we knew was going to happen. Optimal end game for Matthew is to take away uh, Esna and Texts and to play something like Shtick or Shirk. But Caliph is just a point behind that, and he spotted this play. 
uh, good board vision there for Matthew, realizing his best end game. But this puts him up by 10. Esna is going to score seven or 27 for Ben and catch him with four on his rack. And uh, that's the end of this one. Oh, Ben is not even playing ESNE. He's just going to play scene instead. We've seen Ben do this a number of times. Uh, forget spread. Let me just win. Let's cut to overhead mic and see what these players have to say. Yeah. You see them. I thought it was the experience for QITD. White also takes. Yeah, but I thought it was just the <laughs> yeah. normal play. Fair enough. It's bad. I could have played Wavy with the blank. Uh, uh, that was the one. Yeah. Or he would have started fishing and just got only knows. Yeah, I, I, think I had ease for days. I do like all the ease of the ease. I need to try to Ten? Nine? Oh, my ease for You want to dodge? What? What if it's the. Ah, well, uh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Word. Which one? No. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Not which spell Maybe someday I'll learn all the spell of those. <laughs> So not much exciting stuff going on here. I know Ben likes to just clear his head, get out of the playing room as quickly as he can, and he knows he's got a championship game coming up. Uh, if my intel is correct, and by intel I mean Josh literally saying it in the chat, I think our finals here are going to be Ben versus Jason Keller in a winner-take-all uh, game. So that's coming up in CSW. I don't know what's shaken up or what's come down in the NWL division yet. Let me pull up the standings there and see if we've had a clinching situation. So Michael Fagan did win his most recent game. He just defeated Jason Lee. So Michael is at 11 and three. Jackson still at 10 and three. His results against Jeremy Hall still pending, but the winner of that game will go on to play Michael. If Jeremy wins, He's going to have a tall task. He's going to have to win by nearly 200 points. If Jackson wins, we will get to a winner-take-all situation in NWL between Jackson and Michael Fagan. What a showing for Montreal in general, though. I mean, we're, I'm getting tired of saying this. Like, some city, please step up and, like, take the mantle back or at least try to contend with Montreal because Michael Fagan, Jackson Smiley, Jason Lee, Josh Sokol Rubenstein – they're like always in the top three at every tournament I ever watch. And uh, I'd like to see some other city or some other country at least, you know, try to dethrone Canada and Montreal specifically. Challenge is uh, out there for anybody who wants to step up and get good at this game and take down these boys from Montreal. Charles, what about you? Will, will you take it on? Uh, if people want to move to Madison, Wisconsin, we got a, a pretty decently strong scene here. A couple high-level experts, including myself and my brother. But uh, if everybody just descends, we all pick one city and everybody moves there. Uh, maybe we, we'd have a hope of unseating Montreal. At this point, it seems kind of hopeless. Yeah, it seems kind of hopeless at this point. Who else is going to get this good at this board game? Uh, well, we'll see. There have been other hotbeds of Scrabble in the past. New York City, I want to say around the turn of the millennium, was huge. Uh, Portland, more recently, and the Bay Area were both at one point or another huge hotbeds for the game. But right now, Montreal is uh, taking names and kicking butt. So that's what we've seen, I guess. If I had to guess, we're going to stick with CSW for the last game um, because we know that that's a championship game situation. Let me check with our production team. We 
we'll figure it out and I will put it in chat is the word from our production team. So let y'all know, we will be back shortly. Y'all don't go anywhere. Don't forget, like this video. Let's get this finals bumped up on the algorithm. We want everybody watching this final game, whichever division it comes from. So hit that like button, share the link around, subscribe to Let's Play Scrabble if you haven't done that already. And uh, we will be back in just a few minutes with a championship game from Lake George, New York. We'll be right back, y'all.
Welcome back, folks. One more game of Scrabble from Lake George, New York. I'm Matt Kanick, joined by ancient cosmographer Charles Ranke. We are going to show the NWL finals. Jackson was able to win his last game, and so we will see a winner-take-all matchup between Jackson Smiley and fellow clubmate Michael Fagan, both of these guys from Montreal, both of these guys have won a North American NWL championship before and the $10,000 that come with it. And one of these guys will get to claim the Lake George Division I championship at the end of this game. We saw an awesome matchup between these two players earlier where Michael took a late bingo, but Jackson hit him back with a six overlap bingo of his own a bad beat of bad beats we'll see if michael's able to shake off that devastating loss or if the tiles will continue falling in jackson's favor uh, the players are seated at the table tiles are being squared as we speak so scrabble action coming in less than 60 seconds and we will be there for every move of it very exciting stuff charles I know you don't play a lot of NWL anymore, but watching what you have from Jackson and Michael and maybe from your experiences playing them in the past, uh, who do you think wins this matchup and why? Oh, that's a tough call. Uh, both players, obviously extremely talented players. The, the accolades and awards that they've won prove it. You, you don't win nationals by accident. You win by nationals by being one of the best players on the continent. And that's uh, what Michael Fagan and Jackson Smiley are. If I had to pick a winner, I would, I'm leaning towards Jackson here. He won the previous matchup, might have a slight psychological edge. We did see Michael um, make a few mistakes, or at least one big mistake, in the, the previous game that we watched uh, two rounds ago. Uh, but I certainly couldn't say that either one is a huge favorite or the, over the other. It's going hopefully going to be a very well-played, uh, tightly fought game. Hopefully not a blowout in either direction. That would be a bit anticlimactic after the the game we watched them play two rounds ago, but we'll see what happens. How about you, Matt? What do you think? I want to see phony extravaganza in this game. I, I mentioned the book on Michael is he is very reluctant to challenge, so I want to see Jackson capitalize on this. Over under 0 0.5 phonies, I'm taking the over all day. Players are live and ready to go, so without further ado, we will cut to the board and get you all the championship game. Again, Jackson Smiley, Michael Fagan, each of Montreal. I believe we've got the wrong record on display for Jackson. He should be second place. Uh, the winner of this game takes it all. So Michael went first, but spread is irrelevant. One of these players is going to take an L, one going to get the W in the championship. The uh, one caveat, in the event of a tie, Michael would take the tournament. So Michael essentially with a one-point lead in this game right now. Uh, Michael will get to play first, not by virtue of having the better record, but probably just because that's what the computer algorithm said. And Michael has grabbed the tile bag. So we see a handshake once again, successfully converting on a handshake. Proud of these guys. And uh, we will see 100 tiles get played in just a minute. All right, A, I, D, another A, another A, an E and a K for Michael. So a little bit of promise there, but also a lot of vowels on this opening rack for Michael. And this will be an interesting one uh, in the absence of many good vowel dumps out of this play. I think he's looking at maybe a K-A-D-I or an exchange out of this situation. Uh, I don't see anything else good for Michael to do on a tough first turn. So K-A-D-I, I think he's gonna trade five here and I think that's reasonable. If I exchanged, I'd probably hold D-E as well. I think about holding the K and then I think better of it and keep the D instead. And Jackson gonna respond immediately with his own exchange. So we asked for fireworks, right? Uh, we're not seeing any so far, but that's okay. Um, just saving a little suspense for in the future. 
one exchange met with another zero to zero so far in this game. Yeah, and I, I agree with the exchange for both players. Uh, Michael did not have a decent K play. Uh, his one decent K play kept three vowels. Uh, we hammer that on all the time. If you're a new player out there, you know, talking about thinking about leaves, the tiles that you're keeping back, three vowels is not a leave you want to keep. It's going to hurt you next turn. And then Jackson with the, I think it was E-E-I-N-N-U-U, -N -N -U -U, too many duplicates, can't score uh, without keeping a U. Also, uh, uh, very second. Uh, both players have slightly better stuff, although both of them may be tantalizingly close to bingo letters, but not quite there. We'll see what Michael does. And we saw a situation very similar to this come up in our last game, Benji versus Matthew O'Connor. Okay, typically maybe OI is the play Michael wants to make or something in that vein. Maybe a play like hired to play long and score points, but Jackson has just exchanged as well. How does that change the calculus? He's exchanged five, so he's got two above average tiles probably. Um, do you play scared? Do you avoid putting out floaters knowing Jackson's sitting on an above average rack instead of a random one? Uh, do you exchange a second time here, or would you go long and play something like hired or horde here? What do you think, Charles? I would do um, hired here for sure. An exchange five from both players basically indicate, it doesn't indicate that you're close to a bingo, it just in indicates that your rack is garbage, especially at the beginning of the game. Uh, an exchange five is not telegraphing that you're keeping an S or a blank or anything like that. I'll, often if you have an S or a blank, it makes sense to keep more letters than just two. So I'd say no reason to play scared here if you're Michael. You just you take the points that are available to you. And one thing to consider is that if Jackson did exchange five, he's probably not keeping you know, an H or a W or an F or something like that. So the, the double letter score above the E and hired, it's kind of random whether that gets hit for a lot of points. So hired is the play here. I went ahead and put this in Quackle and ran through. Uh, I put in Jackson kept E-N, which he actually did. Michael can't know that, but has to have him pegged on a similar range. And Quackle much preferred a small play of OI or an exchange of OI to the longer play here. Though Michael's found some consonants, which he needs into that OI leave, A-B-B-I-O-S-T. But we'll first look at Jackson's rack, A-E-I-L-N-O-W, on his poll. He's got to make a philosophical decision here. A low, A-L-O-W, plays with four overlaps for 29 above hired. Or he can keep things smaller and tighter and play either W-O or O-W-E. He'll score fewer points, but will keep a more dynamic leave. A low is 29, holding E I N. W O is 21, holding A E I L N. What is your preference here, Charles? Uh, that would be a tough decision for me. Um, sort of like you, Matt, I'm averse to fishing. I, I like to take advantage of my full word knowledge, not just the bingos that I know. And the A E I L N. It's a decent leave with the tiles available on the board and the fact that uh, W-O, uh, maybe not as much potential there as it seems like. I think in the end, I would play longer here. And that's what we see Jackson do. The The downside of A-L-O-W, it does set up sort of a minor hotspot uh, on that triple letter score. But really, once you look at the bag, there's not too many things that can hit you for too many points. Really just the F is the main concern there. So I do like this play. And I think that'd be the decision I ended up making after a considerable amount of agony. Yeah, this is a, a tough situation, but we've seen Jackson very consistently for the better course of a year take these racks and almost always just take the higher scoring play or the one that plays off additional tiles. And that's what a player of Jackson's caliber should do. You do not want these games flipping or turning into coin flips. Uh, you want every aspect to come down to skill whenever possible because you are the best player in this room. That's the mindset Jackson always has, and that's the mindset he should because, well, he's really freaking good at Scrabble. So uh, avoid the variance. I like the idea by Jackson, and he's going to get hit back by Bob. Could have been a lot worse for him with that hotspot he created, but Michael going to keep a nice dynamic AIST leave. And Jackson, 
into his leave of E-I-N, found an R and a D, which are awesome, but a second I got in the way of him hitting a bingo after that play. And now he's going to have to find another tough, or make another tough decision as, you know, it's tempting to play something like M-I and D-O-M, score 14 points, but that is just inviting your opponent to crush you on that double-double line underneath. And D-E-I-N-R, without any floaters to hit eights, this relies on you to pull a seven next turn, which is not all that likely. So Jackson, I'm sure he sees the fishing opportunities here, but he hates them and would rather find anything else. I kind of like this play of Medii, M-E-D-I-I, in the same spot you would just play M-I, or perhaps you play mid or midi in this situation. What say you, Charles? Uh, media looks strong. It kind of forks the board a little bit. Uh, they're sort of wandering into danger here, uh, forming this, the beginnings of what we call a ladder or a staircase. Um, so media kind of averts that. You could also, if you really want to avert it, you could play midline through the L and the I of a low and hired. The downside of that is it's one short of a double word score. Uh, Jackson does not have an S and uh, it could go badly for him, but it, that would be, I would be considering that play just to make sure that the board develops in the way that I want it to. If, I think in the end I wouldn't make that play, but it would be in consideration for me. I might also consider just playing a phony down from the DO in this situation with the book against Michael. I would play like Doramide or something. Um, but it, to make that an effective play, you would have had to make it as soon as your clock started. You can't play a phony after thinking for three minutes. So I think that ship has sailed. And Jackson playing mid here, uh, E-I-N-R the leave, but he sets up both the front I hook that he's holding and the front A hook that he doesn't have. Yeah, this is a good play as well, actually one that I didn't generate um, while looking at the board. So a creative thought from Jackson to sort of avert what we saw developing, which was like a bingo spot. So now he's got Imid and he's also got the spot underneath Bob if he draws what he needs to, which he does not. <laughs> O-U-U is not what he needed into E-I-N-R. That is killer. O-U-U. And we are back to nobody bingos in Lake George. As Michael, who held very good tiles on his own accord, found the E he was looking for to play into A-I-S-T, and then another I and another S, and he now has a difficult decision to make as well. I think he's looking to play I-S and Webs. Uh, maybe missing something. Maybe he's looking to play I-mid instead, though I-mid has a front hook of its own that would be T, timid. So I don't know what Michael could do here. Issei, I-S-S-E-I, -S -S -E plays beneath Bob. Uh, kind of crazy play, but maybe worth making here. There's lots of challenging decisions in this game so far. Yeah, the, the SEI play actually does look... Uh, relatively decent. It, it takes the S, S-E-I-S, -S, so he's setting up an S for himself. So D, D O S, even E and an S. Let me double check that. Uh, yes. So it, he, again, he forks the board for bingos. If the draw works out for him, he's again for the second turn in a row drawing into A, I, S, T, um, but with a few more chances to get a bingo down from it. So that's a that's a creative thought. I, I was also wondering if he was setting up IS and Bob up to make sure he still has that S hook. Um, he's doing AIS instead, which is a similar oh. idea. Oh, I do not like this. All right, so yeah, AIS is the move for Michael. Uh, Jackson's head has to be spinning right now. Wow, you must be very close to bingo range. You definitely have at least one S on your rack. Um, and now there's a bunch of bingo lines. You've got a mid and I mid on one side. You've got all the lines for sevens on the other. And I've just drawn it O-U-U. This sucks. But what did Michael just draw except G-I-U? Nobody bingos in Lake George. Wow. So Jackson immediately exchanging the three tiles he's just drawn. And Michael's got to do the same thing, right? You've got to exchange at least IU and probably the G for good measure as well, right? Yeah, you just exchange the tiles you drew. I think I think there's not a play here worth making. 
Auri and Imid, the only play generated that makes almost any sense. Uh, Auri and R-A-I-S, another option. Each of those holds in you. I think you just, ex oh no, I've got the wrong rack and I apologize. That was Jackson's rack. Jackson already exchanged. So Michael, E-G-I-S -I, -I, I think both plays were in the same situation. So your commentary actually applied perfectly to both players' racks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think both just exchanged the three tiles they just drew. This is this is wild. <laughs> this is sad. How many U's are they going to draw when they look to bingo? Yep, we see the exchange from Michael that is, I think, what we agree with. There's plays he could make, but they, they keep poorly, and he's committed to the bingo right now. So did Jackson draw a bingo? No, he's playing in Lake George. Nobody bingos in Lake George, but Jackson has 39 points in here from the eye. Scores very well, but Michael is clearly very close to bingo range. He didn't like the three he pulled after AIS and exchanged those three, but if you give that many floaters away, especially in an E and an R, you're going to get bingo next turn. So Jackson can score 39 and concede the bingo, but the board construction right now really only allows sevens to go and sevens are a lot harder to hit than eights. So we'll see, does Jackson want to try to keep things tight or will he just pounce on the 39 points? I think he needs to. I don't see any other plays worth making that don't open other things up. And I think Jackson's gonna go through the same thing and eventually kind of hold his breath, play in here and accept that he's getting bingoed on, but at least he's got 39 points in the process. Yeah, it's worth noting he is at a small deficit here. He does need to score points at some point. You you can't just play for leave and board construction the entire game. You do have to, at some point, score enough points or at least more points than your opponent. And so in here it does seem like, I would say, really the only choice for Jackson on this turn. Uh, expert analysis from Charles Reinke, ancient cosmetographer, scoring more points than your opponent helps you win. And uh, Michael is going to look to do that on this turn. He has set up Scotty, a valid seven that plays with Imid, and the R Jackson exposed gives him one other bingo, uh, Cottiers, C-O-T-T-I-E-R-S. So Michael will have to choose between these two. Scotty scores 70. Cottiers scores 74, and I think you've got to take the extra points and the more defensive of these bingos in this situation. And that's what Michael's going to do right here. So the bingo for Michael puts him ahead 138 to 87. And I can't believe we just keep drawing IIU out of this bag like over and over, but Jackson has found it yet again. Somebody needs to just play like Tui three times in a row, so I don't have to see this anymore. I'm getting very frustrated myself. Uh, Tui might be what Jackson plays here, T-U-I, on the left side of Cotiers, making T-O-U-T and I-T for 14 points. Uh, that is a rather defensive play, and in Jackson's situation, you're not looking to play defense, but I don't see any good plays from that H. So you're either playing Tui, or maybe if you want to, you can play Milieu, or Muley down from the M in mid. Those Both of those plays, I think, give up a lot back to the opponent. Yeah, just a, a series of kind of frustrating racks for Jackson. Actually, his previous rack was all right. It didn't make a bingo, but it at least was balanced and didn't have a U on it. Well, we're back to the U's now, and it's, it's just not much fun to watch. And if we're feeling sympathy up here in the booth, imagine how the players are feeling having to actually you know, play with these letters, and these letters are dictating who wins the tournament. In terms you know, of for a couple I, grand, um, I'm a lot more angry about drawing UII. Yeah, that that's kind of a, a meme. I wouldn't say a meme among Scrabble players, but like Rex draws like UII are just well known for being horrible, and it's something that you can complain about to a fellow Scrabble player and they'll know exactly what you're talking about and how bad that is. We've all been there before, and while we don't like to admit it, we know we're going to be there again, and yet we keep coming back to this game because we are all collectively gluttons for punishment. 
Quackle had an interesting idea here. This 2e play gets hit back very hard by overlaps a lot of the time, especially with AIT type words. Um, and Quackle actually liked playing Litu, L-I-T-U, through the T in Cotiers for 10. That is winning a sim by about a point over 2e. So maybe a slight misstep from Jackson, but a small one. E E E L O V blank. And Jackson has demonstrated the most cardinal rule of Scrabble. Once you play off the U after exchanging it two other times, you'll draw the Q. 100% of the time. I think it's actually written into the box rules. And Jackson demonstrating that right here. He will have QI for 35 beneath mid, but of course, of course, Jackson draws the Q because that is in the rules. Yeah, I actually have a, a set from my grandma, uh, one of the original Scrabble sets. And that rule is in the box, but she crossed it off. Um, unfortunately, they also give you a magic tile bag with those older sets that guarantees the uh, play that you draw the Q rule. So you can cross it off the board you can or box. You can try not to play with that rule. But there's some kind of cosmic destiny at play that forces these things. This play looks awesome for Michael, but it is really bad for a number of reasons. Evolute looks like a nice way to score, but its anagram, Velute, plays in the same spot. Evolute is bad because A, you're opening the board in a game where you're winning when you can shut it down with Velute, and B, it takes a front hook. So it takes a front R. So you're giving up massive opportunities. Maybe Michael thinks with the blank, I prefer this open board, but I say shut it down, let Jackson open, and then bingo when he does. I think that is a huge misstep for Michael, and we'll see if he gets punished for it, though it doesn't look like he's going to. Ooh, Jackson did get a blank, though. Lots of stuff going on right now. Yeah, J Jackson actually <clears throat> did have the blank last turn, I believe. Um, so now both players uh, eagerly looking towards the bingo. But I agree with the assessment of Evolute versus Volute. Um, Michael's holding the blank. There's a there's a, a couple minor spots to bingo. He doesn't need to get hasty about his bingo. He doesn't need to rush towards it. He can sort of get to it over time and pounce on any spot that Jackson might open up. So um, in in the lead. You, you generally want to play defensively, and I think in this case, defense was warranted. I, I agree, um, but Evolute came down, and Michael has drawn numerous bingos this turn. He's got set up on his rack Felonry, which plays above Evolute, uh, making YE. That is 71, his, not his best bingo. Um, his highest scoring bingo plays down from the H, and I'll just park that there and let y'all solve that. It's a fun one. Um, he's also got a number of 75-point bingos. Uh, Reflown is one of them. That plays above the uh, above Evolute as well, but gets all of your non-blanks on the double letters, which you would prefer to do. So Reflown, Fondler, or Fluron are all 75-pointers playing where he's looking at playing Felonry. Uh, the bingo from the H is higher scoring, but not one I would be looking to make if I were Michael, because it is Hornfells, H-O-R-N-F-E-L-S. That word is what we call in Scrabble a sticky S word. It is not good as a seven. There is no Hornfell. You must have the S on, your, uh, on the end. But I'm not throwing an S in a triple-triple line in a game I'm already winning if I am Michael. No way. So Michael's got to play one of his bingos on top. Yeah, for sure. He's um, he's looking at the spot he just cre created with Evolute. This did, did end up working for him because if he had played Volute instead, his choices of bingos are considerably more limited and he might have to do something like Hornfells against his better judgment. He would also have to find the word Hornfells, which is not a straightforward to, word to find for any player. But see, if you play Volute and then you bingo underneath QI with Reflown... That's like all but game over, right? Oh, that's that's actually a good point. I had forgotten that there is the there's one bingo that plays making a hook on MI. So yeah, that actually does um, help Michael significantly. 
just keep the board closed when you're winning. When your opponent opens it, bingo and close it again. Like it's it's a formula for success as old as I've been playing Scrabble, and uh, I think just a huge missed opportunity. When you find a good play, keep, keep looking until you see a better one. Evolute looks so good, but it is so bad compared to where he could be right now. Michael's bingo is a big decision for him to make as well because Jackson is holding on to some very good stuff of his own accord, E-E-L-M-P-R blank. Oh my goodness. That happened, right, Charles? Oh, whoa, I didn't even realize he had made a play. I, I was kind of like thinking about Jackson's letters and yeah, here we know that Michael saw a bingo. We know that he was thinking about felonry and instead he passes it up. Uh, I'm not sure what the reasoning was there because any bingo he gets next turn is not gonna score as much as Felonry. So um, a little bit of a question mark there. I'm not sure what we just saw. That is, that is killer. Now he's drawn another bingo. He's got Ronalds, R-O-N-N-E-L-S. That is his only playable bingo and he's got two spots. But you know, if F-E scored 40, I could see passing the bingo to score now, but F.E. scored 18. Did Michael miss every bingo in that rack? Did he miss Floron and Reflown? Did he chicken out of Felonry? Did he miss Hornfells? Uh, I, I don't have any analysis to offer uh, at this point, but that was very uncharacteristic for a player of Michael's caliber. And we have seen a lot of blunders this tournament. I don't know what's in the water in the water in Lake George or what these players are doing at night, but uh, I think they need more sleep or something. This has been some sloppy play across the board. Yeah, that, that one that one is a a big question mark. Um, my my can only assume that he saw Felonry, didn't think it was good, and then missed other bingos because we know Michael is a, a relatively strong strategic player. He would understand that scoring. Uh, what is it 18 points for fe is not worth passing up a bingo especially on a board where bingos are not necessarily guaranteed so we do, michael we do see him play the bingo up. so passing up on one bingo letting jackson bingo and then playing a much lower scoring bingo after the fact michael could be up by a lot right now and i've just seen you know two plays back to back evolute and then fe are just confusing mind-blowing i don't know these are plays michael will certainly look back on if he loses this tournament and just shake his head at because uh, you can't blow those opportunities especially not against a player as good as jackson so for what it's worth michael is still in the lead here he's got a nice 30 point lead um, jackson has some relatively good letters maybe slightly consonant heavy again fg together is not what he wants but if he can do just an fe play somewhere and start building towards another bingo there's tons of a's in the pool um only two a's on the board so seven unseen uh, the A goes really nicely with G E G N R S, so a fish might be warranted here. Yeah, I think the R is a very powerful tile for Jackson to hold onto as well for the Revolute spot. So even if you do miss a bingo, plays there are going to net you thirty or thirty-five, and you'll likely be able to keep scoring well in the future. So I oh, but Jackson's knocking out that spot. Yeah, this is his highest scoring fish of F E, but. I think I would have rather played it beneath Ronald's anyway to keep Revolute open. Maybe that's too big a sacrifice, but I just feel like this gives Michael so much in exchange um, and eliminates one of your best scoring threats in the Revolute spot. In any case, this is a play Jackson makes. There are a lot of A's. I think there are seven A's on the scene to Jackson and three I's, and instead he picks up KV because we are in Lake George and nobody bingos in Lake George. Yeah, that's a very rough draw for Jackson. That's exactly what he didn't want to draw. He's significantly further away from a bingo than he was last turn uh, when he wants obviously the exact opposite of that. And 
Now we're looking to see what Michael does. He it looks like he's getting ready to play XU underneath Impaler. Or he could do it under Ronalds. I guess he has a choice. Ooh, I would take it up top. You're winning the game. But okay. We, we see it on the bottom. Uh, three extra points for Michael. XU puts him up 283 to 240. And Jackson, with that KV draw into EG and RS, faces an uphill battle to get back into this one. He does have Veer and Revolute up top. GKNS, not the leave he's looking to keep here. But I just don't see much else that's worth doing. He can play Vog through the O in Evolute if he wants to sell out and try to bingo right now. EKNRS. But you've got to look at the unseen pool with seven A's. A-E-K-N-R-S. What is that bingo with? I think you bingo with a D. You'll have Darkens. Uh, an I for snakier. I'm not seeing too much else. Tankers. Is Yankers yeah. good? Maybe I don't know. But I like this. I like Jackson keeping the scoring pressure on, setting up his S on top of that. And uh, scored 42. That's a good play for Jackson because he held that R last turn. Last turn. Michael wasting no time, keeping the powerful egg combination and playing City. Uh, to go with it. So big score for Michael, 40 points. And Jackson, A-G-K-N-O-O-S um, for him. Uh, I think Michael missed a big opportunity there. Siggy, C-I-G-G-Y, and Viri um, was awesome for him. And I think maybe he didn't notice that the Y spot got opened up, but Siggy, uh, a way to undouble those Gs. Maybe he's making a meme for the chat here trying to keep egg, but I think another big missed opportunity for Michael. And yet he continues to nurse this lead as Jackson draws another poor draw, getting a bunch of O's somehow on this turn. I'm getting a lot of shades of Baltimore right now where Michael makes a few mistakes and doesn't seem to get punished hard for any of them, though there's still a lot of Scrabble to be played. Yeah, that's kind of the annoying thing about Scrabble is your opponent can make mistakes and still win. Uh, this is something that chess players don't have to deal with as much, and it takes a different psychological approach to the game to not be upset by these things. Of course, you know, in the middle of a game, Jackson doesn't necessarily know that Michael is making mistakes, although he can probably tell from Michael's bingo of Ronnell's uh, that FE was a mistake. Like, you can infer that in the middle of the game, and that can sort of get into your head a little bit where you're losing to somebody who you know messed up a turn. Everybody's had these games as well. If you've ever played a tournament where you know your opponent is making blunders, maybe they lose a turn or two and you just can't catch the stuff to catch back up. And it is so, so frustrating, but you have to keep it cool. You have to understand this is a long, long game and just, just keep on pounding away and do your best. You have to stay calm. And I will see if Jackson's able to do that here. I like this play he set up of hookah a lot. You can see there are still six A's in the bag here. And GNS plus an A is so-so. Those I's are going to be nice, but you have to prepare for a second A, or for an A draw, maybe even two if you're Jackson. I'm not looking to hold an A on this turn. I'm looking to play one off. I'm sure Jackson is thinking long and hard about playing look or looks down from the L. Putting an S on that middle triple word in the bottom is always so good to do when you're down because obviously tons of words end in the letter S, but S is also the thickest section of the dictionary. More words begin with the letter S than any other letter in the English dictionary. So putting an S on that triple is very dangerous for your opponent. Uh, there's so many bingos that can play to or from it. And on top of that, it's incredibly hard to block effectively. If you make a word to the S, unless it's got a JQXZ, it's probably scoring 12. So looks is an appealing option, but I don't think Jackson is down quite enough to be this desperate. I really like hookah here for Jackson. Yeah, hookah does set up a very easy to use S hook. He, he's got already got one on the board under NU making NUS, but you really, your intuition in these situations is you would like to a spot for a seven-letter word ending in an S 
to play on the board. Currently, he doesn't have that Huka gives him that spot. Um, it's it's just something that you like to have available for you. And I agree with Matt that you don't want to keep an A here. It's too many A's in the bag. Uh, playing one off is kind of a requirement. So Jackson playing Ponga instead of Congo, and it is so easy to autopilot into Congo on that rack, but Jackson wisely identifying six unseen A's. I am playing off my A, and he has drawn another A as well as another O. Ooh, Ostracon would be awesome if he could find a T, but alas, it's not there. Michael plays Hagged almost immediately, holding on to J.A., and it would appear Michael is on a hold here as Jax, as he has, hasn't drawn his next tiles. So Jackson would love to pick up a free turn. And I'm sure he's not 100% on this word either way. These are always so hard. The short words, can I put ED on the end? Can I put ING on them? Are they verbs, nouns, adjectives? Uh, lots of stuff to think about. But Jackson's probably going to try to assess, can I win this game? with this current situation, if this word stays on the board, or am I sunk? If I make a play like K-A-O-N, making OXO and none for 29, what are my chances of winning? They still seem rather low. Maybe I have to challenge or I'm dead in this game. Or maybe a play like looks makes uh, this board the dynamic in the ways that I need it to be dynamic. One interesting thing about the pool here is there are no E's, and it's a, actually a very ugly pool from Jackson's perspective. We'll get it up in just a moment, but if you're Jackson, I don't know that bingoing is going to happen this game, not with a pool this bad. And I think maybe you have to be looking for other sneaky ways to get back into this game. Are there scoring opportunities he can set up? I don't know. Yeah, it definitely hagged. It takes out it takes out the N spot under NU unless you have a, a bingo with an O. Um, it takes out bingos from the H. There's not really anywhere else to bingo. So Jackson with this play on the board of hagged basically has to switch his mindset. He has to stop thinking about bingos. Keeping bingo prone tiles is not what he needs to do after this. He would need to keep scoring prone tiles. And it's sort of hard to do on a board where there's nowhere to score. So it does leave him in a kind of awkward situation. I think this is a perfect situation for Jackson to think about phonying here. Uh, the Collins 5 K-O-N-D-O plays through the D. Uh, that does a lot of the things you're looking to do right now. Um, and it makes it very hard for Michael to play underneath that and crush that triple letter score because you've got an S and you're going to hit back with an even bigger play. I don't think Michael could possibly challenge a play like Kondo. He can't lose a turn and uh, let Jackson just straight pull ahead. I think this is prime time to play a phony if you can't find a play you'd like here. But we may see Jackson challenge Hagged instead. Yeah, a challenge here would be uh, pretty devastating for Jackson. Obviously, losing a turn is critical, and it also leaves him with one fewer chance to try to do something like looks or even look um, to, by the time something works out in that spot of the board, he's, you know, 30 points further down and it might not make a difference. And it looks like the challenge is happening. That's rough. Yeah, I mean, Jackson identifying he's a big underdog in this game. He needs a break. And I think he feels this is the best way for him to get it. I'd still play the phony here over challenging Hagged, I think, but that's because I feel like I've seen that one before. Uh, but Jackson taking the shot, doing what he can, and because this is an NWL game, for those unfamiliar with challenge rules, Jackson is losing an entire turn on this. So play passes right back to Michael um, as Jackson forced to essentially pass on this turn, and that may all but do it. Michael Fagan looking to be your champion of this Lake George tournament. Although, what is that? WUU? We might have some drama yet. Yeah, it's not over. With a with a draw that bad, it'll take him a little bit to extricate, although he can he can just play jaw and wet. Just forget about the fact that he's drawn two U's. So he can deal with that later, just score some points. Uh, that puts him up by a significant amount, I guess almost 80. Um, at least over 70. 
and that's a uh, plenty of cushion to deal with the the two U's later on. So Michael looking to block here. He set up Taj on his rack T A J. Playing that on either side of the hagged play is going to be a great defensive option, but he has to be concerned as well about OXO plays and good underlaps. Now, Jackson clearly didn't have one last turn. It would have come down if he did, but Jackson can continue to address that line. I bet we see something like OK or OKA come down for Jackson in the bottom right corner to create a second bingo line and say, all right, I've got one chance to draw something good, Michael. Let's take a shot. The WUU missing from the bag on Jackson or on Michael's rack significantly help Jackson's chances of pulling something good. And Michael picking up two of those surplus of A's left in the bag creates some extra, extra drama in this one. Buckle up, folks. It, does, it felt like this was over after the challenge, but this could be interesting yet. Yeah, and I, I'm actually really surprised by his play of Taj, Michael's play. Like, if you're going to play there, Jaw, I feel like it's unambiguously better because the W is not helping you, especially with the two U's. Um, you can also do Jot if you want to get rid of one of the U's. Uh, Taj plays your most flexible tiles for not enough um, payoff. So I, I'm not sure I agree with his choice. It looks like Jackson looking to play OK. I think OK and DO is going to be the play. Jackson just has to think about, hey, if I do pull the bingo making OXO, am I yielding so many points back to Michael that I'm still going to lose? You know, if he just plays DOW and WA anything, like WAY, that scores so much that I think it still outruns Jackson's bingos. So I don't know how Jackson needs to approach this. He's got to consider that unseen pool as well. There's a lot of sticks, a lot of one-pointers, but also W-Y-Z-J. Um, if he makes a play like Oka, O-K-A, and D-O, he's probably getting hit hard by one of those. Yeah, that, I think that that is probably off the table for Jackson doing something wild like that. Um, but you never know. It's He's... Definitely feeling it now down by 71. Desperate times do call for desperate measures, and this is certainly a desperate time for Jackson. So I think you just kind of throw out a Hail Mary here. Maybe Jackson, he's opting not to seed all of these points. He's fishing okay elsewhere. Going to score 22 here, but he's not opening the board. If Michael has an O, he can just knock out Oxo and end the game. But he doesn't, and I think Jackson knew that. I think there was only one O left, and it was on Jackson's rack. The Y, still unseen to Jackson, though, was interesting. Jackson has drawn a bingo. This is a huge swing, and it plays beneath XU as well. So Michael, terrible rack. Jackson, great pull on the fish. This one might be interesting. Oh, man. So Michael looking at Awa to address the E and the D and Hagged, that's a great play. But Jackson's bingo of non-arts still fits. Yeah, that is um, quite a turn for this game. To For, for Michael, I'm, he, I'm sure he recognizes that the spot underneath XU is the spot he needs to be concerned about. He just can't do anything about it. If he wants to do something about it, he'd have to play Saw, S-A-W, making N-U-S. And that just, the, the leave, you can't really stomach it. Stomach it. It's so bad. But maybe it's necessary here. I, I don't know. So Awa, the play for Michael, U-U-S-I, the leave. He's leaving two tiles in the, or three tiles in the bag. And Jackson now with the non-arts, he's going to have to think for a second before he throws this down. I've got the bingo, right? Uh, I, I can win often enough after this that that maybe there's a miracle. You know, if I pick up the Z, if I get tiz down from the T in non-arts, maybe there's a chance. Uh, if I pick up the Z, there's that ADZ spot. Did Michael just set that up for himself? Is Michael smart enough to do that? There's a lot for Jackson to think about here. He can't just pull the trigger. If he feels he's a long shot, he actually needs to forego a bingo this turn to try to hit an out bingo. But I think, I mean, I've got inside knowledge. I know Michael's wreck is terrible. Uh, if Michael has the Z, Jackson's done even after this bingo. 
Yeah, he's got to take the bingo here. There's, uh, with the, the pool as bad as it is, what what does he even... Um, what does he even do after he passes up the bingo? It's like he he's not not likely to draw another one. There's no ease. There's not no good letters to bail him out. So the three tiles in the bag, Z A P, and that plays right now with A D Z for over fifty points. Now that will get blocked, but Michael's going to have to sacrifice everything good on his rack in order to make that happen. Uh, I've run the end game through, assuming everyone plays perfectly. If Jackson plays non-arts, he wins this game. But that is so hard for Jackson to know. He he has to feel he's a huge long shot to win this game after the bingo. He's probably thinking that was a Z setup for Michael. And I think he's about to pass up on this bingo because he knows he can't win. But the crazy part is he will The bingo puts Jackson up by six points. He'll draw three tiles and basically, okay, he is going to play it. So this Jackson almost got very cute. Um, he's going to be so surprised. Watch his face as he reaches in and picks up the Z and a vowel to go with it. Jackson's going to feel so elated going from 5% to 95. Watch this. Oh my goodness. Z, P, and there's your A, Jackson. <laughs> you saw it on his face, right? Did I just did I just win? Uh, he doesn't yeah, know he this. Did. He's got a minute and 35 seconds to figure out this whole end game. And Michael's got two choices now. Either play it as fast as possible um, and just try to block ads and hope Jackson does something stupid or figure out the exact right end game. But every second you spend here gives Jackson more time to think this through. Michael can take away ADZ and ZAP. He has to. He's got to play DUI, I think, here. Um, but Jackson just slow playing the game from there because Michael is holding ISUY, will not be able to go out. And Jackson can slow play it, drop the Z, and then the AP next turn. This is Jackson's game. Yeah, I don't I don't think Jackson messes up this end game even with uh, somewhat low time. Uh, he's he does I mean, he almost can't mess it up because there's no way that Michael can go out fast enough to win this game. There's just no way to engineer a sequence, at least that I see, that would be, you know, going out even within like three turns. And so Jackson's going to be able to score with the Z, he's going to score with the P, and it's going to be his game, I think, relatively easily. But I, this goes down. I mean, this was Michael's game to lose the way Jackson drew. I swear Jackson probably drew seven U's this game, although Michael's got two on his rack right now. Jackson missed every bingo draw basically all game until non-arts at the end. But Michael, you know, just squandering percentage points, that Evolute over Volute came back to kill him. The bingo miss of Felonry was brutal. XU at the bottom instead of at top created this devastating bingo line that Jackson was able to use to get back into this game. Now, I don't want to dump on Michael all day. He's made some very good plays this game, um, and he wouldn't be in this mess if he didn't draw basically the worst case scenario draw on this rack. Um, he certainly got unlucky, but Scrabble's all about taking those 95% win chances and pushing him up to 97 or 98. And because Michael failed to do that in this situation, he's going to lose the tournament. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't want to unnecessarily, you know, rag on players, but Michael did have some missteps here that we can, we can see directly how they cost him the game. And it, I, I think some of them weren't even really a question. So th there were some, some plays here that Michael probably wishes he could take back. We've got to make like a Twitch emote of Jackson's face as he draws a peak, like just that shocked, like surprised Pikachu face. Like what? What? And as he's slowly gone through, I bet Jackson's figured out by now with his tracking, this is his game. And he's just sitting back all smug. <laughs> like, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. Uh, 
I've run out of analysis. I just, I'm, I'm in shock as well that this game ended the way it did. Michael's got Dewey set up on his rack. He has to take away Zap, but there's nothing else to do. I'm hearing from our production team. We are going to get a little bit of postmortem from these players afterwards. We will bring the winner of this game, who I presume is going to be Jackson, uh, backstage for an interview. So if you want to hear Jackson's thoughts on one of the most wild games of Scrabble I've seen in recent memory, uh, stick around. We will get him on camera. And if you all have questions you'd like me to ask Jackson, drop them in chat and I'll do what I can to get those across as well. As Michael agonizes over this end game, this whole tournament was brought to you by an amazing team at letsplayscrabble.com. Josh Greenway, the brains behind the operation. Noah Slatkoff sitting there quackling every game. No FaceTime, no, no glory, all the work uh, to keep these scores updated. So huge thank you to both of those. Thank you to everybody who's been watching us uh, day on and day off. Thanks to each of my three co-commentators, Charles Ranke, Austin Shin, and uh, Jeffrey Pogue, each of them was awesome to work with and make my life so, so easy. Thanks to these players for some awesome Scrabble and some teaching moments as well. Um, and yeah, just to everybody. Thanks to Tournament Scrabble. Thanks to everybody else. Now's the last chance for us to drop plugs. So watch Charles on Twitch, Ancient Cosmographer. Uh, watch Austin Shin, if CSW is more your game, Austino9. Uh, watch Heidi. Heidi's going to drop her channel once again, Heroin Two Birds, I think was it. Um, watch Will Anderson on YouTube, Wanderer15. He's got some awesome stuff. I've got some videos on YouTube from a long time ago, if you don't mind watching two dictionaries ago. Um, and everybody, try to find a tournament near you soon. I am already on the list for the Crescent City Cup in New Orleans in uh, in January, MLK weekend. Get out there and go play some Scrabble. Like this video so we get bumped up the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel. Josh will be bringing a lot more Scrabble. Maybe I'll even be back on the mic for some of it. DUI, the play Michael reluctantly has to make, and Jackson has opportunities to botch this endgame if he wants to, but he's got a number of winning plays, seven of them. The one thing he shouldn't do is play zip right now through that eye. Yeah, that would be a major misstep. And uh, Matt, while you're giving all that thanks list, it's quite a long one. Uh, it's missing somebody important. Uh, and that's yourself. Uh, thanks to Matt Kanick for leading the commentary on this stream, uh, tireless, tirelessly doing a great job every single game. And I'm sure me and the rest of the co-commentators can agree um, our jobs are a lot easier with Matt doing most of the heavy lifting. So great job, Matt, on another tournament successfully commentated. You say the word tireless. I disagree. I am quite tired every time I do one of these, but I would be even more tired trying to make these plays over the board. My word knowledge is so bad right now. This is my way to give back to the game I love uh, without having to work quite so hard, but I am tired. Thanks to everybody for listening to me this entire time and for watching what ended up being an awesome game. Uh, and a, I couldn't ask for a better game to clinch a tournament as I do feel like the player who played better here ended up being rewarded for their efforts. And yeah, we definitely had no shortage of things to talk about. So that, that makes a, a great experience. We're not watching a blowout. We're not watching easy plays. We're watching some tough decisions and some questionable decisions that we can spend some time discussing. So Michael, uh, that's killer. We've been in this situation. Ooh, okay. He's going to try the desperation pony. Um, Jackson immediately challenges this one. Doesn't even bother doing the math to figure out if he's going to win or lose. He just, just stops the clock. And this is going to come back off the board. Jackson would lose if this were valid. Um, but alas, it is not. So Michael, one last ditch effort on Lytus. That comes back off the board. Jackson's going to plunk this P, and I'm going to shut up to get to overhead Mike. I'm sure we'll have some interesting talk from the players on this one. Let's hear it.
Yeah, sorry, that was insane. I, I thought you were setting up the Z. I played this thing and you were trying to get the Z. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I couldn't win by normal means. That's no, no, of course it wasn't. Yeah, I don't no, believe I mean, it's pretty much the only draw I can win with. But is that idea? Well, there's probably a couple others. But like, I need to see that. If you have to see, um, yeah. What if I just have ADs and I don't have like a? Even then, I think you can like, score enough points. Like I'm, I'm not trying to break through. Like, crazy. I, uh, I couldn't believe. It. I thought you were setting up the Z. It kind of makes sense to make it work. You can yeah. draw it. Or, I was only worried about like a bingo. Yeah, you're blocking bingo. Yeah, I still have side. No, I could play to block that though. No, of course. Kind of really bad back, so I kept an ISU to get with that. Yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, that looks good. Z O U T D. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I was wondering why you were looking for it. Yeah, I didn't think the loop would be that much worse, even with the note. I hadn't ever said that Ben or anything was like longer good or fondler. Yeah, I uh, 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 Oh no, you're right. Uh, Hornfell is just Helen Helen Reed on the Lord. It looked bad. It looked like my system was great. It was kind of like a Sunday school video. It's almost like it finally got the temperature right in here. Where's the server? That's the one thing I'm going to write on the server. Everything else is, is gold standard. Yeah. I might do two weeks. Never. I might do so in two weeks. Chip, yeah. Not me. Congrats. Two and two today would be good enough for me to win. I don't know, I think we can have a bunch of them get over there. We're trying to hear, having a hard time hearing it, but Jackson, you hear him saying, I was so sure you set up the Z, and the only way I win is if I draw the Z. Unreal, unbelievable stuff. Uh, Michael asking, is Velut a word? I think it is, and agonizing over, oh, well, that was a missed decision. Okay. Um, you know, the, the things are coming back out from these players. Um, Josh is going to go grab Jackson and bring him back to our makeshift interview room and we will get his thoughts on a ridiculous game although i think we've already heard a few of them uh i had no idea i thought he were setting up the z i bet jackson almost passed up on non-arps thinking he'd need an out bingo instead and a block of the z play um just absolutely wild stuff and i'm very curious to see what jackson has to say about the game you see uncharacteristic word knowledge mistakes from both of these players uh, and we've seen it a lot scrabble sort of has an on season over the summer is where most of the big events are two different tournaments with the ten thousand dollar first prize and the world championship was last summer as well um and in the off season middle of winter fall kind of like this uh some of the players are a little more rusty um, and that definitely coming a little bit through on this. So let's see. I think we've got our interview station up and running, and we are just looking for the Jackson to sit down in this chair, and uh, we get to pick his brains. Any uh, questions y'all have for Jackson? Now's a good time to drop them in chat, and uh, we will try to pass them along to Jackson, of course, assuming they're good questions and you know PG-rated questions.
and we will get a Jackson soon. I'm sure. I, I, I bet there are some celebratory, you know, high fives and hugs going around. I know several players have a longstanding tradition in Scrabble of if I win a tournament, it is my job to magically make beer appear immediately and offer one to everybody I encounter. So maybe Jackson is out offering beer to some folks, but here he has the walk of glory. You can see even from that, like, I can't believe that just happened. Jackson, <laughs> can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. <laughs> just just, yeah, what, just talk. Like, what the, what just happened, Jackson? Tell us yeah, about it. I don't know. I don't know how good the cameras were watching me, but uh, as soon as I pulled that draw, like, I actually, my eyes doubled in size. Like, I actually had that, like, comic book look of disbelief. I could not believe that that was the draw. I don't know how few draws there were that actually won. The reason I didn't play non-arts immediately was, like, I thought I was so dead. It was like, chances are this is a Z set up with ads. Chances are if it's not, he's drawing the Z. There's so many reasons I'm not going to win the game. Even if I draw the Z, I, there's probably a lot of ways I don't win. I couldn't believe that draw. Especially, like, you know, after Hag, that was kind of like, you know, we know how that is. You, you're, you don't deserve to win after challenging a phony. I, had, in a way, kind of checked out of, uh, of feeling like I needed to win. <laughs> crazy, yeah, crazy. No, I... I, I even told everybody watching, like, watch Jackson's face. He's about to draw AZP, and we all watched it together. It was oh, a priceless was moment, <laughs> actually. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we went through the whole thing. Were you thinking about not playing non-arts at any I point? I was, yeah, absolutely, because I um, I was at first thinking, oh, well, it looks like a Z setup. And if it's a Z setup, there's zero way I win if he has a Z. And so I was thinking, is there a way to block it while fishing? And then I hit some unblockable finger. Like I was looking at, you know, 2% wins because that's how dead I thought I was. But then the problem was to block ADZ, I have to spend my O, which means I'm, I can't hit OXO. So eventually I realized, you know, Awa, it's possible. He just had nothing. There's eyes and using the bag. Maybe he's just making his best blocking play, which is what was happening. So I accepted, like, I could draw the Z. And then, and then it happened. <laughs> Yeah, I just, that was incredible. Like when I put together AZP is in the bag right now and yeah. Jackson, you're going to win if you play the bingo. Like it looked like such a trap. It looked like don't play the bingo and yeah. try to have a Hail Mary hit. And yeah. uh, apparently the Hail Mary was just playing the bingo in the first place. Yeah. And, and what kind of, it flashed through my mind briefly, the feeling I would have of playing like a fish somewhere and drawing a Z. And I was thinking about how that would feel. So like, okay, at least I won't. I'll prevent that from happening. At the very least. Right. And and it is even more mind blowing because this is a championship game. Spread doesn't matter anymore. You play yeah. for the, the win. And so you normally in a regular game, you just play non arts and say whatever, but in this one yeah. spread doesn't matter. And it was a spread play that won you the game with just the craziest pull I can remember in recent history. Yeah. This whole tournament, crazy pulls have been happening like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm glad that it didn't have to come down to spread. Cause I've been throwing away spread left and right. You saw it in against Jeremy Hall playing Die Dynast, which is very much not a word. Uh, so I, I mean, Michael had not. Michael had been collecting spread all tournament while I'd many times thrown away 50-odd spread points. And so he was lucky in the first place that it just came down to the win. Um, yeah, just awesome stuff. Did, uh, and we, we heard after the game, so Michael was asking about the missed bingos uh, when he fished the F. He found out about those. What did he say? So he didn't see any of the bingos. I think he went through the alphabet and just nothing popped out. It's one of those racks I can see, especially when you're looking at suffixes and stuff. You, uh, it's easy to miss stuff like Fleuron or Reflown. Um, it sounded like you may have seen Fondler, but wasn't sure of it. I, I didn't. It wasn't clear. He had set up Felonry at one point on his oh, rack really? and backed out of it. So It wasn't clear if he had seen those or not. It sounded like he hadn't seen all of the bingos. But obviously that was another big break to catch because of the rack I was sitting on was such a specific bingo rack. I, had, I only had Impaler pre-meal, and then they weren't going to fit looking I, uh, in MI. So uh, that was another big break. Um, a lot of big breaks throughout the game, let's say. A lot of terrible breaks across yeah. the game, too. I mean, how many times did you fish and draw, like, IUU or something, yeah, yeah. and yet, like, you were able to sneak it out anyway? Yeah, I mean, at first it was feeling a lot like a classic Lake George Finals. I don't know if you know, but uh, this might be my fourth time playing for first in Lake George, and every time before, I've lost the final game. I've lost to Jason Lee, Cesar, and Seth Lipton. And then I was thinking, okay, you know, this is just the – this is the Lake George curse – you know, there's a Lake George curse, and then I won't win the finals. That's fine. I was already accepting my fate. When I drew the O-U-U to E-I-N-R, I was like, okay, that, that's fine. 
Yeah, another another like George finals, yeah. and then the best you've ever seen in your life, AZP after the bingo uh, to sneak Great. that out. So, how much is the prize for this? Do you know? I have no idea. Keeping a surprise, but uh, we shall see very yes. soon. All right, Charles. What questions I do you got have? The for I, I got the director right beside me. He's, he's not really sure. <laughs> maybe <laughs> eight, maybe nine hundred. I'll give you an envelope with some money in it, Jackson, and you'll accept it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Charles, so, what questions do you have for Jackson? At any point, Jackson, did you think about making like a four tile play or a three tile play off of the L and Ronalds to do like an S setup? That was like an outside chance that we were looking at because you were getting sort of desperate down by a bingo. For sure, I was getting more and more desperate. I looked at like playing book there. The problem is there was just too much that could happen. There's the S in the bag lurking, so that just hits any setup immediately. And then no setup could, like every setup could be blocked um, just because of the K. There was eyes in the bag, you can just block something so small. It just wasn't at the score where, it's not, it was at the score where he could sacrifice a lot to block and feel comfortable, especially after Hag. Um, that was a, that was a thing. That was. Part of why I challenged Hag as well was figuring like I was just down by enough to kind of need a bingo anyways. It was looking a bit, I don't know, obviously not a good play. I could have just played Cal. Yeah. Well, a really there. cool game. Uh, Well-deserved victory for you, uh, but also just, you know, victory from the jaws of defeat. That's incredible. One last question for you. What's next? We've seen you win ten grand and a big title over the summer. We've seen you now win the elusive Lake George title. What's next for you in Scrabble? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to continue to grind, continue to improve, uh, continue to yeah, always improve at whatever dictionary that may be at whatever dictionary that may be all right well we've got the director captive we want to get everybody their money and send them on home so we'll wrap here jackson smiley congratulations your 2023 lake george champion finally break those shackles congrats jackson thank you both very much yeah great job jackson and with that we will conclude our coverage of the stream thanks again to everybody for watching and all the names i shouted out jackson go get your cash Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Uh, and with that, we are going to cut the coverage as soon as Josh figures out what happened to his laptop that Jackson just killed. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in and spending your weekend with us. Let's all go touch some grass and we will see y'all next time. little extra FaceTime. Should I get some, uh, there we go. Nope. No, should I get some uh, karaoke going? Hello, everybody. We're back. 15 more games. Yeah, 15 more games. Welcome to your coverage of Lake George 2024. Just kidding. We're off. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all the viewers. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Josh. Please end the stream. <laughs>